Hello and welcome back to Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 World Tour. We are about to fly over on our way to Greenland. We're finally at the top northeastern part of Nunavut. Basically, we are at Cape Dyer in Nunavut, north of the Arctic Circle. We're going to go across the Davis Strait. And this is going to be a lot of water, so I think what we're going to do is we've got a different f airplane, as you may have noticed. Gets a little bit better top speed. Hopefully I can fly it, fly it reasonably well. And we're going to fly all the way over to Greenland and then kind of go down the coast of Greenland. Probably all the way down to the southern tip at Cape Farewell. Then back up the eastern coast of Greenland until we get close enough to cross over to Iceland. <clears throat> so that's the plan for today for the podcast I think what we're going to do today is June, Monday, June 20th it is Juneteenth today recognized um, it is 1247 in the afternoon I think what we're going to do we've got some um, I think we'll start with the Tony Kornheiser show from today and we've also got the um, Sharp and Benning show from Omaha, Nebraska that we'll probably get into after that. And then a couple other shows if we go that long. We'll see how long we go today. It's going to be a, a lot over water though. So that's why I wanted the kind of faster plane here today. But we're about to start. Let's queue up the Tony Kornheiser show from today, June 20th, 2022. Previously on the Tony Kornheiser show. I thought of Chuck Todd. <laughs> I did. I thought Chuck Todd and the French horn. Yeah. And then I thought of the Thin Man, because everybody says Thin is a Reed. Yeah. Right? That's yes. a very common thing. Yes. Then I thought of the Thin Man. By right? the way, Willis Reed, another Reed. Willis Reed. Yeah, yeah everybody. Lo I love the captain, number 19. I might call the kid the captain, <laughs> but I was thinking of the Thin Man. The, uh, but how about the captain? I kind of like the captain. How captain. about the captain, captain. number 19? Captain. Left side, number 19. <laughs> Tony Kornheiser show is on now. So that's what the kid is. He's the captain. It's as simple as that. He's the captain. Willis Reed, and I mean, uh, for other people, it's Derek Jeter in New York. Many, many years after I left New York. But for me in New York, it's Willis Reed. So the kid is the captain. And the fact that there are three children in Michael's household now has kept Michael away from us yes. today. I mean, this is, this is a little bit... Two is a lot harder than one. Three is a lot harder than two. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, three. It's when hard. you go from playing man-to-man -man defense and now three you're under five. Yeah. Come on now. Come on now. That's so a we lot. took the day off. That's okay. Um, I, I'm not going to start the show. I would have if Michael were here. I would have started with the golf, but we have Chuck Culpepper on soon, so I'm not going to start with the golf. We'll just go to that with Chuck Culpepper, and we'll have Mark Maskey on in a little while as well to talk again about Deshaun Watson, who we talked about with um, Jason Lock and Ford the other week. And it's, it's endlessly fascinating to me. And it really is. I mean, I, I don't know how he's going to play. Right. This is just me. Yeah. And I know there are a lot of people out there who will, their rejoinder will be very simple. He's not accused of anything criminal. Grand juries have said, no, we are not going to take them. And I understand that. But to me, it's like, but there's 24 lawsuits. 24 lawsuits. How is this guy going to be eligible to play? So we'll talk to Maskey because Maskey had a story the other day about how the league is going to do something meaningful, the meaningful suspension. Yes. You know, not something casual. So we'll talk to Maskey about that. There's two things I want to talk about other than the fact that I bought the TaylorMade Stealth Driver and so far it works for me. Oh, really? So far I'm getting about 10 to 15 yards more and I'm getting rolled. That's fantastic. Well, I got to hit it well, which I don't often do because I stink. But, <laughs> you know, I played uh, Saturday and Sunday and hit the ball pretty well. I was happy about that. It was so, windy yesterday, which you said was, was much windier Saturday. Oh, was it? Much, much windier Saturday, yes. But you, you don't mind playing in the wind. You I like playing. Yeah. Well, I'm no good. I don't really keep score. It doesn't right. matter. I just like being out there. There are two things I want to talk about. And one, and we don't do this a lot, one is the hockey. And I want to talk about the hockey because I can gloat. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to gloat, but I'm going to gloat now. <coughs> Excuse me. We had uh, Mark Messier on the show, on the PTI show last week, before the first game. And I said, don't you think that Colorado should be fa favored? 
Don't you think because they had a better record during the regular season, they had more points, they had more goals than Tampa Bay, and in the playoffs, they had been even better than Tampa Bay, going through their division, their conference, quicker than Tampa Bay went through. Don't you think they should be favored? And Wilbon laughed at me. Oh, no, 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 no. The Ning should be favored. He's the only person who calls me Ning. The Ning should be favored. And Messier said, no, Tampa Bay should be favored. So after the first game was played, I said to Wilbon, you, Wilbon, and your boy, Messier, made fun of me, but I'm up one nothing at the moment. And I'm going to ride the hot horse. And I'm going to say that Colorado's going to win game two at home in Colorado. Not because I think they're going to win, but because I think they should be favored. And Wilbon laughed at me again. Seven goals later, I don't know that Wilbon is laughing. Tampa Bay has given up 11 goals in two games and scored one on their own. Right? No, no. Is that it? No, 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 no. The, the first game was 4-3. So they've scored three on their own. It was 4-3 and then it was 7 nothing. Right? You can check that. I yes. think I'm right on that. Yes. 4-3 and 7 nothing. Andre Vasilevsky who Wilbon believes is the greatest goalie in the entire world, has given up 11 goals. Unless they yanked him from game two, which I don't think they did. He's given up 11 goals in two games. Now, again, I'm not saying that Tampa Bay can't win. You're looking, am I right yeah, on the numbers? 4-3 and 7-love. Seven, yeah. seven right. yes. So did, was Vasilevsky in the whole way uh, on the second game? See if you can see that. I'm, again, I'm not saying Tampa Bay can't win or won't win. They are the two-time defending champion. They certainly can win. But in order to win now, and they go home, they go home. But in order to win the series now, they have to win four of the next five games. That's a tall order in a championship series against a quality team. They'll have three games at home. That's all they'll have. So they're going to have to, of those four, they're going to have to win one on the road, it seems to me. Yeah. Because Colorado gets two more at home if it goes seven. I'm just saying it's hard. I'm saying that perhaps Wilbon and Messier were blinded by the light of the two Stanley Cup championships, as as we all would be. Sure. Colorado looks better right now. Right they now, also I score mean, a goal and a half a game more in these playoffs when you, than Tim. When you put up a seven spot in hockey, I mean, that's that's just a lot. Uh, Vasilevsky uh, did, was in the entire game in game two. Think he's shaken? I would think a little bit, you Gotta know. Be a little bit, I right? Mean, I, I gets mean, home, gets home, you know, it's sure, better. But, I mean, if you're the coach, I mean, I might have taken him out in that game just saying, yeah, I look, I don't know we're, we're not going to win this, so let's just save your psyche for game three. I don't know. You know? Uh, if I'm Colorado, <clears throat> I'm not trying to sweep them. I just want to win one. Just win one. Just yeah. win one there. Yeah. And then they got to win three. You know, yeah, and if you're Tampa, it's you have to win game three. You oh, have sure. to. Sure, yes. sure. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about, and people that know me or, you know, people understand that I have OCD, and it has to do with numbers a lot, and I look at numbers on license plates, and I add them in my head, and I'm very attuned to D.C. license plates. I don't care about Maryland license plates. I don't care about Virginia license plates. <laughs> I don't care. I care about D.C. license plates which in the main have two letters and then four numbers. And the letters are of an order. In other words, about over 20 years ago, I think, I think it's over 20 now, DC changed from six numbers to two letters and four numbers. And they started with AA. And they went all the way through the A's, and then they went BA, and they went all the way through the B's with one exception, they stopped, I'm pretty certain about this, they stopped using I, because I looks like one. Sure. So when you're announcing a license plate, <coughs> you would not necessarily know the difference between I and one. So many of the ensuing letters don't have the I, but I think they have everything else. And we went through the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's and the E's and the F's, and we are now, I believe, into the G's. And you may even have GI for all I know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not certain about the I's, and someone can tell me about this, but I'm pretty sure, because one, I'm pretty sure that one or two of the letters did not have the I's. But that's not even, that's neither here nor there. We're in the G's, and I have seen GU. 
Um, and you go all the way through, you go 26 letters in the alphabet, unless something has changed since I was born, and we're using 28 letters now. I just thought we had 26. I've seen GUs. I have not yet seen a GV, but I, I'm certain the GVs are out. I haven't seen a GW or a GX or a GY or a GZ. I know I have not seen a GX, a GY, and a GZ. And the other day, I saw not one, but two plates, JA, and not JA done. <laughs> no time for you today, JA. No. I saw J-A, which means there's no H. There's no H, yeah. Well, what happened to H and no I? And again, in my head, I'm thinking I, where well, you can say, okay, that's the number one. We'd get the plates wrong. If you were calling in something to the police, you could get the plates wrong. Okay. Right. I understand not having I. What happened to H? Yeah. Did somebody simply forget <laughs> when they were ordering the plates? Do prisoners still make plates like they used to? I don't know how you get plates. I don't, I don't think I don't think they still make. They used to make them in prisons. Yes, yes, that famously. was the work. <laughs> but that's a hundred years ago. Right. I have no idea. Somebody could tell. But how did we get to J A? Yeah, and it was a J A four start. It's like so that means at least at least three thousand are down the drain. Right. Yeah. I. I. I really? I have not noticed this. This is, I'm obsessed with this. Right, but now I will not be able to avoid looking at every single DC license plate and looking for an H, you know, just to see if it's out there. Well, uh, we went to J. We skipped H utterly. Yeah. Somebody will know. Somebody will know. Yeah, I'm sure somebody, somebody can... will email us, right? Yes, I, that's, I would think so. It's disconcerting to me. Yes. Well, yeah, it breaks up the, uh, what the symmetry doing? of it all, doesn't what it? What are we doing? And I, again, I haven't seen any GX, GY, GZ. Did we just stop? Did we say, you know what? Jeez, we've had enough of you. We're going straight to J's. Right, enough. That cha it changes, for me, it changes everything. Sure. I don't really understand it. And it's not like people, it's not like the two that I saw were personalized license plates. Yes. I mean, I don't, maybe they were, but I don't know. I wouldn't. They had four numbers. No, 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 those weren't personalized. Nobody's going to say, yeah, give me the personalized number, J, J, Z, whatever, you know, 44, 44. Something yeah. Something like that. Very strange. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I've got. Um, we'll get into the show. We'll have Chuck Culpepper talk about the Masters. Matthew Fitzpatrick is a big day for Wilbon. Matthew Fitzpatrick went to Northwestern yes. on a scholarship from England following Luke Donald, who had come over from England and done so well at Northwestern and on the Pro Tour. Matthew Fitzpatrick went to Northwestern, and Wilbon is ecstatic. All day yesterday, he said, I think he can win. I think I said, I think he can win. I don't know that he can win, but he won, and he won with a great sand shot on 15, I think it was on 15, and then he poured in birdies, he poured in a birdie from like 45 feet at one point. He won, nobody lost and gave it to him. He won the tournament. So we're back with Chuck Culpepper, I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. The Tony Kornheiser Show was brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yeah, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts, like having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, National Annual Average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is sent to us by Brent White. I'm going to read this. This is long. By the way, the, the name of this band was The Squires. And this is a song called Anytime that was recorded about 45 years ago. Tony, I've attached some real music for your audience. Today in the 60s in Northern California, there were many small-time garage bands. I was fortunate to play in a band called The Squires, not to be mistaken for the successful British band, The Squires. 
And by the way, this sounds just like the monkeys. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. Just like the monkeys. We were together for four years, and I was the youngest at 17 years old playing keyboards and bass. We had 150 songs in our repertoire, and about eight of the songs were original songs written by our lead guitarist, Chuck. We played small gigs, mostly frat parties at Stanford, UC Davis, local parties in Sacramento. In 1967, our agent, Betty Kay, got us a summer gig playing at a new pizza place and party house in Davis, California called Mousy's. It was an all-summer job, which was fabulous because it meant I wouldn't have to work at my father's store doing all the garbage jobs he could, he could, so he could show the other employees he wasn't showing favoritism towards me. Another band was also hired to play, and we alternated weekly. The name of the other band was The Gollywogs. At the end of the summer, both bands were invited to San Francisco by Fantasy Records to record original music. We were totally freaked out, couldn't believe it. We felt we did the big time. This is just, it's, this is the plot of that thing you do. Exactly, including We recorded our music the at the Rep at Fantasy, and the Rep at Fantasy told us to listen to the radio day and night because our songs were going to be played on the air. Can you believe it? Our band, the Squires. We stayed up all day and night listening to KFRC out of San Francisco and KXOA out of Sacramento, waiting to hear our songs played. About a week later, a song came on, and it was one of the Gollywog songs. We were ecstatic. We thought our song was sure to be next. At the end of the song, the DJ told the audience that the group was a new band called Cretan's Clearwater Revival. <laughs> we thought, no way, that's the Gollywogs. Obviously, Fantasy Records asked them to change their name. That was that. CCR became one of the greatest bands ever. Unfortunately, the Squires were never heard from again, and our songs were never played on the radio. So now we're doing it. Yeah. 40 years later, and maybe that? 50 years later, we're doing it. That was any time. We'll have another song later. That plays in Chuck Culpepper, who was, I believe, and I don't say this all the time, sort of privileged to be at the U.S. Open at the Country Club. Because that was a great tournament. Um, at one point in that tournament, you had seven people, worldwide top ten, in contention. They all fell off. I think I'm right on this. Chuck Scheffler, McElroy, Matsuyama, Burns, Morikawa, Rahm. That's six. Six in the top ten. And none of them won. If you and, and you, you were there. How do you do, how do you explain six in the top ten and none of them wins? Well, privilege, yes, to, to start there, yeah. and um, because that was some event. But uh, I, I just this this guy Fitzpatrick hits seventeen greens. Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. Seventeen greens. I mean that's. And I, Nicholas said it in a uh, social media post, I guess, that it was just one of the best rounds he had ever seen in a final round, you know, especially given the circumstances. So, I mean, I guess if you think about it, this guy at ranked number 18 as he played that round is a top 10 player now, or it, it didn't probably was yesterday morning when he started. Right. Anyway, so, right. Yeah, so it's yet another in there just seemingly boundless uh, parade of of risen stars that they have. And when you look at a tournament, there are so many people who legitimately not only can win it, but maybe even, you know, win it decisively. There's lots of them. It's hard to follow in some ways. There is, I mean, the, the problem with Matthew Fitzpatrick, and I don't, this is not a problem, and Will Bond should love him because he went to Northwestern. The problem is... Is he Danny Willett or is he Nick Faldo? You know, people like Danny Willett pops up and he wins the Masters. Justin Rose pops up, has a really good career. Um, but I, Nick Faldo is the standard bearer for British golf at this point because he ended up winning six majors. There's, there's no, is he Danny Willett? Is he Michael Campbell? You know, we, you can't know, right? They all look good when they win, right, Chuck? Right, that's right. And I just think there just seems to be such an air tightness to him yeah. that makes me think that this is not a one time deal although one time I was at this tournament in Palm Springs and I was all excited about Steve Stricker so nice and I wanted him to win a major and I mentioned to this great golf writer Jeff Rude who oh, has sure. a cigar in his mouth unlit and who says to me they're hard to win so I always try to keep that in mind uh when I'm projecting how people were projecting McElroy at 10, you know, the last time he won the major eight years ago. So, and it's been eight years now. So, right. but I do think multiple for this guy. So let's get to what was, I mean, everybody will differ as to what was the critical point in, in the round, but I believe it was this. 
I believe it was on 13 when Fitzpatrick birdied and Zalatoris came back and made par. And within 30 seconds on 14, Scheffler missed a six footer that could have tied him for the lead. To me, that was the point in which everyone but Zalatoris and Fitzpatrick fell away, and I wasn't even going to consider them from then on. Are you in accord with that, or do you think, no, that, that's too early? I thought it was, that's too early. I still, had, I still had Scheffler in there, even as he played 18. I still thought, he's just playing some, you know, here's another one. He's 25. He's younger yeah. than, than uh, Fitzpatrick is. Here's another one who, you know, the, the brand of golf that he's playing is just, it's just pristine to watch. It's just, you, you just think, you know, these shots are almost, you know, just hard to believe some of them. They're so calm. He's so calm and they're so, they're just so true and pure. And I just thought still to 18, I thought, okay, he's still in it. And I thought it would be thrilling if he had birdied 18 as he did 17. There are two, there are two misses on 18, Scheffler and Zalatoris that, that, create the situation where Fitzpatrick wins and they're both close and they both both miss on the left and I thought Salatoris's putt was in from television I thought it was in how about you um yes definitely yes yeah, so then then you're going to have a playoff it's it's an interesting it's an interesting circumstance the shot of the day ultimately turns out to be I guess on 18 it, it, so you're on 18 Salatoris and Scheffler are one behind um, Fitzpatrick as it turns out before Fitzpatrick and Zalatoris get to the green Scheffler misses a putt so he's at five and and Zalatoris is at five and Fitzpatrick is at six um, Fitzpatrick tees off and you hear you very clearly hear I assume it's Paul Azinger say you just can't be left you just can't be left in the trap you cannot be left in the trap you have to be right and he puts it left into the trap and Azinger again says, what a huge mistake. Now, Chuck, you are thinking the exact same thing. You're thinking this is a bogey, and, and, and maybe Zalatoris wins, or maybe then we have a three-way playoff. I'm thinking three-way playoff at that point. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking that I'm thinking of Scheffler inside watching somewhere, and I'm thinking he must be thinking, oh, wow, I'm, I'm about to go back out and play some more because... You know, they, and they had just commented about Scheffler when he teed off on 18. And this, I think it was Azinger said, now the thing to do is to avoid the left. Yeah. You know, just, you got to avoid that over there, that left. And so, and so here's a guy who hooks right there into the left. And it just seemed, <laughs> it just seemed the bogey was, was clear. And then he Maybe makes, he makes a great shot. Now he had made a great shot from you know, off the course earlier in the day as well. And by the way, he goes for it. This kid pulls out three wood and goes for stuff that other people don't go for. And he appears to be a skinny little kid and he kills it. As does Zalatoris. They kill it and they're not like Deshambo. They're not large like that. But he gets out of the... He hits... That wins the tournament. That shot gives him a comfortable par, right? Right. And... The shot on 15 that you mentioned as well. Yeah, that yeah. comes from oh. one of those, one of those, you know, where you have to park the, the gallery into a into a little, what would you say, a little alley where you yes. knock yep. the ball. Comes out of one of those, and it too goes up and onto the green, uh, improbably, both of them. So, yeah, these two shots are. Everyone's going to talk about the one at 18 forever and should. But I the thought the 15, 15 shot was tremendous. It was tremendous. Yeah. Absolutely tremendous. And, and and you just watch as Zalatoris left a putt a couple of inches short on 17. You know, I mean, and and it is said of Zalatoris he can't putt. And it is said because for a few years he hasn't putted. His record in the majors for a young kid is spectacular in terms of getting into the top five or certainly the top ten. If he makes that putt, I mean, that, that's what, what I'm saying is that this tournament... You can say that Rom backed off, and you can say McElroy backed off, and Burns backed off, and Morikawa took himself out of it on Saturday, uh, and you know Matsuyama was too far. But you can say all these things about these great players. But these two kids, they went out to win it, and 
Fitzpatrick won, right? There's no doubt in your mind Fitzpatrick won this tournament. No doubt. And they, and they, they played brilliant rounds that made them look like 37-year-old people who've been doing this now. Of course, Dallas Torres has six top tens in, in the nine majors he's entered. Yeah. And so he has been doing it, but still, he looks beyond is 25 and still has a one on tour which is on pga tour which is odd but um you know just the way the look about them, the whole look of them just their level of confidence it was just it was really an endorsement of that idea that's been going around in recent years that the kids who come out of college golf are way better than they've ever been and the sort of the you know i, I realized since patrick didn't stay the whole time but um just the people who are in their 20s now are so ready to do this. This is what I think as well. I think of McElroy and Thomas, Fowler. I think of them as young kids, but they're not. The young kids are Morikawa and Hovland and Wolf has taken himself out of it, but these two as well. I mean, you know, people, who's Matthew Fitzpatrick? Well, he was a Ryder Cup kid. I mean, you don't just, you don't get on the Ryder Cup because somebody knows your dad. It doesn't work that way. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, this kid can play. He looks like a total child. He looks 16 years old, but he can play. He won the, U and, and it is that great statistic that he won the USAM at the country club and stayed in that same house this time with the same people. That's a lovely story, is it not? It, sir, it, it is, and just the whole, you know, the whole idea, that sort of myst mystery of, you know, walking around a course that you've seen before and just the little moments that maybe you, maybe you yourself can't even describe or, or define of where it helps you and where it helped you to have won there before. And of course, when he won that U.S. Amateur, Zalatoris played in that as well and then went around in the years after telling people that's the hardest course I ever played. So, didn't so, Scheffler play in it also? That maybe probably. I'm wrong. I, I thought maybe he played in it too, but I'm not sure what the, their ages are. This they're around the same age, are they not? Or is Scheffler a year younger? Or Zalatoris a year younger? Scheffler and Zalatoris both 25. Right, and yeah. Fitzpatrick 26. Yeah. 27. 27. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, I no. mean, it, it was there was a really cool tournament, and now I'm going to ask the question that nobody wants to hear anymore which is um, what happens, you know, with the, does the Saudi tour go after Matthew Fitzpatrick? I know it was buried for 48 hours because for 48 hours there was great competitive golf with great names on the board, but does it rear its ugly head as soon as the tournament is over, Chuck? Oh, I would say absolutely. I would say that if you'd like to listen in on the phone calls that are going on, you know, it was interesting that, that the, the, Live Tour players did not fare well. Very, very badly. Yes, very badly. Uh, DJ tied for 24th. Reed tied for 49th. DeChambeau tied for 56th. Richard Bland, 43. You know, those are the only four who made the cut. That was, and that, that, I think that helped the tournament a lot too. Mm -hmm. to, as you say, uh, bury this thing for a few days so we didn't have to really think about it. But, but um, I have to start wrap up thinking about it again um, I know as you say nobody wants to hear the, the question but it's inevitable I can't imagine that Greg Norman isn't going to make a phone call to Matthew Fitzpatrick Can, I can't imagine he won't right don't you feel the same way I would guess he's just waiting for whatever he considers to be the polite time to call someone in the morning today <laughs> yes. and then <laughs> right. right because I mean it's it's easier it's easier to poach the European players. It, they've, it's, it's been shown it's easier to poach them. And also, and then, and then this week there's a tournament in Oregon, right? That's coming, yes, that's right. Are you going to go out and do that? I'll be at Wimbledon, so I'll miss oh. out on that. Oh, well, you know what, Wimbledon's a better gig. It is, True. it's a better, it, it's, it's a better gig. Oh, good for you. All right, anyway. It's a better gig than just about anything, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for being on and always being there when we ask. And, and I apologize, as I always do, for talking too much. But I got very excited because I really liked the tournament. I liked it. I thought it was good. No, thank you more. All right.
Chuck Culpepper, boys and girls. We take a break. Uh, Mark Maskey will join us when we return. I'm Tony Kornheiser. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is a Sunday read. You'll never dread doing lawn work again once you team up with Sunday. Their lawn care products are quick and easy, and you won't even have to go to the store. Everything is delivered right to your door. Everyone wants a beautiful lawn without all those harsh chemicals. That's why this year, you should use Sunday. It's made with ingredients you can actually pronounce, like seaweed, iron, and molasses. And the best part, it works. Does your lawn have weeds or bear patches or pet spots? I got pet spots. <laughs> Sunday can help you solve all of those problems and more the easy way. Well, I got pineapple, too. I mean, let me be fair here. Right. I appreciate what Sunday does, but I've got Finn who, of pineapple lawn care. Yes, but I will say this because Michael uses this. Yes, he does. And having been over to his houses and seen the lawn, I mean, it's Lovely. it's fantastic. And he's talked the, you know, you just you put the pouch on the hose. No, it's, it's, it's very it's, simple and it yeah. works brilliantly. His lawns are just fantastic. Sunday's got everything you need from fertilizer to seeds to weed control. It's all delivered right to your door. Your yard is your personal oasis. It deserves the best. Sunday helps you grow a beautiful lawn control pest and fight weeds without the toxic stuff. Sunday's lawn care products are made with your family in mind, and that's why they use ingredients you can feel good about again. Molasses. Who doesn't feel good about molasses? Right. And, you know, after you pour it on the lawn, there's some left over, eat it. It's molasses. Come on. The best part, it really works. Sunday is offering listeners to this high-quality podcast 20% off. A full-season plan could start at just $129, and you can get 20% off when you visit GetSunday.com slash Tony at checkout. That's 20% off your custom plan. Here's what you have to type in. GetSunday.com slash Tony. Use the code, people. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. The Tony Kornheiser Show. It's just... This is it, crazy. It's sort of... I, once again, this is Brent White, and this is these are the Squires from 40... At least 40 years ago. Maybe more. And it just sounds to me like they went in the studio last night and said, let's do that thing you do. Let's just do that. Let's have a backstory. We'll send it to this moron who does a podcast. He'll, he'll, he'll hook him so easy because he loves this kind of music. You know, I would buy this, this album. Sound, this sounds just like there's a group, you got to be old, the Grassroots. Oh, sure. This sounds just like the Grassroots. Am I right, Sean? Just like the Grassroots. Absolutely. You know, these are the Squires, the Squirers. It's women set up. <laughs> we love it. We've been totally set up. If people like the Squires want to send us their original music that was recorded a thousand years ago, how do they do it? Yes, including the Gollywogs, if they want to send us yeah. anything. Uh, jingles at TonyCornizerShow.com I mean, I don't I don't mind being hooked like a fish. I don't mind. Listen, if I'm hooked, I again, I love these songs. Yeah. I think they're great. Mark Maskey joins us now. Maskey had a story over the weekend. Um, a really good story about Deshaun Watson. And I'm endlessly fascinated with the notion that people think this guy's going to play i just don't, i can't bring myself to think this and mark the the nfl is leaking is leaking the nfl is trying to the what what is the key word in terms of the type of punishment that the nfl is strongly considering for deshaun watts i know i, I think actually the key word at this point is arguing and and, and and, and that, that goes to the fact that, that, that people have to look at this process completely different. Now, I don't know how much people knew about, you know, how the way player discipline in the NFL has worked over the years, how closely they followed, you know, some of the other cases under the personal conduct policy, you know, ben, going all the way to Ben Roethlisberger, Ezekiel Elliott, some of these other cases. But it's different now. Uh, and, and it became different with the last collective bargaining agreement in 2020 and this was something the NFLPA was pushing for for a long time you know they 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 didn't want Roger Goodell to both make the first decision on player discipline and then you decide to appeal and then it also goes to Roger Goodell so that obviously was not something that the NFLPA thought was a great system Uh, and what the NFLPA wanted was a system where Roger Goodell made the first decision and then you could appeal to a neutral arbitrator well the you know, the league and, and Roger Goodell weren't willing to go that far, weren't willing to disrupt it that much. But one of the concessions that was, you know, CBA negotiations are a trade-off back and forth. But one of the concessions the league made was, there's, so there's a new system now where the initial decision is made by a neutral arbitrator. And then the appeal goes back to Roger Goodell. So it's a different system 
than, than any of these other cases has been resolved under. Um, and it's really, the funny thing is, is, is this is the first case. So this is the first case that has come under the system. So we don't know exactly how it works, how it's going to play out. It's a, obviously a very high profile, highly charged case um, that, that, that becomes the first case, but th there will be a neutral arbitrator. It's a former U.S. district judge named Sue Robinson, is now an attorney in, in Delaware. So each the the league will go to Sue Robinson, and then basically what I report is the league has, you know, its investigation is done or nearly done. The NFL has concluded yes, and it, in the view of the NFL, Sean Watson violated the personal conduct policy. The NFL will argue for, and and people on both sides of the case said to me the NFL will argue for a significant suspension. That's, That's the word they used. Significant. That's the word. Significant. So. Now one person on on. On the player side of the case, on Deshaun Watson side of the case, and they have a very good idea now at this point what the NFL is going to ask for and argue for. And and, the, and I said, well, is it going to be you know a one year? And then it's probably so. So on Watson side of the case, probably one year. But we we don't know exactly what the NFL is going to argue for. But we, we do, I think we now know that that it's going to be significant. Uh, what the NFL is going to ask for. It, it could be one year. So that those are the terms that people should be thinking of. But again, it's not just a case where in the past where the NFL decided what it's going to do, therefore that's what it is. In this case, the NFL has to go make its case before Sue Robinson, the arbitrator, say Watson, we believe, violates the personal conduct policy for these reasons. We believe he should be suspended for whatever. And then the NFLPA will make its case and may say, you know, we concede that he that he violated the policy, or we say he didn't violate the policy, and therefore we think the discipline should be this, or there should be no discipline. Then Sue Robinson will make a decision. Now, if, if she says there was no violation of the conduct policy, the case is over. If she says there was a violation of the conduct policy, and I decide that this is the the discipline and suspension of however many games, then either side, the NFLPA or the league, can make the appeal back to Roger Goodell, and he makes the final. Yeah, so this that's is, how it works. And yeah. That's why I say that I think the right word is argue. The NFL will have to argue its case at this first step before this neutral arbitrator. Although I think we could, I think we could safely conclude that since Roger Goodell has the right to make the final decision after an appeal, that he would, you know, bring the hammer down, you know, if he could. We, I, I, I suspect that's true. But let me let me go backwards for a second, and and have you describe to people. This is not real court. This is not real law. When people say, well, he wasn't even, you know, indicted, Mark explained that that doesn't matter. That's not right, exactly. what, it, it's issue. And, you know, and, and when we see that before in the personal kind, if you go all the way back to Ben, ben Roethlisberger, he was suspended without criminal charges. You know, and I know people like to say, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Well, yes, I mean, obviously that's a bedrock principle when you're, you're in course in court in, in a criminal case, but this is this is your employer's policy. This is your employer having the right to say this is not up to our standard. This is not sort of the image we want to project for our business. And now it's a collectively bargained thing. So it is done between the league and the NFLPA, and we have seen the NFLPA in the past go to court over some of these third disciplinary cases. But but in general, the courts, you know, the NFLPA did win a few times. But in general, the courts sort of reaffirmed that Roger Goodell has the right, has a lot of authority to do what he thinks is right in these cases under the system as it existed before. Mm -hmm. So, again, this is, as you said, this is not court. This is not the, this is not sort of the burden of proof that exists in, in, in the criminal case in which Watson has not been charged with a crime. It's not even the burden of proof that exists in the civil cases that are now sort of pending. This is an NFL policy. This is your employer's right to say this is not, you know, what we want to project in our business. This is not the standard that we set for our employees. So I sit here, and every single time Deshaun Watson makes a public statement, and he denies doing anything wrong whatsoever, and then he says, I want to be a role model, I sit here, and I'm, I'm slack-jawed by this. And I wonder, do you think that Deshaun Watson's public statements are hurting him? You know, it's a difficult question because there are several audiences for Deshaun Watson's public statements at this point, and I'm sure they are largely crafted 
uh, by his legal team. So uh -huh. you, 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 you have the audience of what's going to happen in court, and there are certain things they have to say for that. And then you have the larger audience of, of sort of shaping public opinion. So I, I, I would give two answers. I assume he is saying the things that his, his attorneys have told him to say, and therefore, you know, in that way, they believe that that's bolstering his legal case. In the court of okay. public opinion, you know, I no, I, I don't think he's helped himself very much in the court of a public opinion with some of the things that he said. I think per, particularly in, in the first press conference he did, sort of his introductory press conference with the Browns, where he had that one line about how he had, has no regrets about it, and then he had to come back in this latest one and sort of readdress that and, and, and try to explain that, well, I don't have any regrets about what I did, but I have regrets about how this has affected everyone else around me. You know, that sort of back and forth, that doesn't help you in terms of public opinion. But I, I do think most of what he said has probably been crafted by his legal team as to how it plays out in that realm and perhaps in the realm of the NFL disciplinary process rather than the primary concern being sort of you know, what he really thinks. Uh, which, which probably doesn't matter in, in terms of what they're telling him to say. And also in terms of, of how it plays in, in the public, I think those are, are, are pretty far down the list. I think it's what he's being told to say probably is within mind of you know, the legal cases that are pending. I assume the NFLPA has to advocate for him. I, if I was in the NFLPA, legally, legally, yeah, legally, yeah. I mean, legal if I'm paying dues, to represent him. Yeah, yeah, if I'm paying dues, you got to right. got to advocate for me. Right. Um, did I see at the bottom of one of your stories that one of their positions, the NFLPA's position, is well, you didn't punish Robert Kraft, and you didn't punish Dan Snyder. Although I think they did, I, I think they took the team away from Dan Snyder for some period of time where he's not allowed to do anything. Does that work for you? Is that is that that doesn't really work for me, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, I, I, you're right. You're exactly right. That, 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 and, and everything you said, you're right. The NFLP has a duty of representation with Deshaun Watson as it goes through this NFL disciplinary process. They can't just say, you know, even if they wanted to, they couldn't say, oh, you know, you know we don't want to be part of this case. No, they, they have to be involved. They have to represent his side as this goes through the NFL disciplinary process. In this case, they brought in Jeffrey Kessler, uh, their outside attorney, who is a you know is a guy who they, they bring in in some of these tougher cases, who is a very strong advocate and will fight the NFL very hard at every step along the way. That is his history. But yes, that, I, and I don't think that will sort of be the bedrock of their case. But uh, but I was told that, that was one of the points that they were raised. That look, and it's not just that you haven't disciplined these other owners because Snyder was disciplined, yeah. but that you haven't you didn't suspend those owners. Right. Um, I think that will be the argument. How can you just how can you uh, suspend Deshaun Watson where you didn't suspend these owners? And, and, and they will cite the sort of part of the personal conduct policy that even says that you know owners are held to a higher standard. So how can you not suspend these owners and then say that that Deshaun Watson is going to be suspended and and you know as the NFL argues for a significant amount of time where the policy specifically says that owners are held to higher standards. I, I don't know that that will be the sort of bedrock of their defense. Right. It won't maybe right. not be a main point, but, but I always thought it will be at least part of their defense. And, and, and I, I understand that because you have to do something like that. So I'll get you out pretty much on this. How long, in your opinion, what do you think the suspension will be? And what do you think of Cleveland? What do you think of Cleveland putting itself in this ridiculous box you know, they don't have big, they have nothing. They have no quarterback, it seems to me. Uh, what do you think of what, what has happened there? That's, that's to me, terrible ownership. To me. To me. You know, the first part of it, I mean, I, it, it's hard to know because, because, you know, we're because of the process we describe, that it's not just sort of the NFL knows what it wants to do and then does it. And, and, and you were, you know, the point you made earlier is right. That if the NFL thinks it should be this, well, then maybe it will be that because because ultimately Roger Goodell will decide yeah, the appeal. But, the last but call. Yeah, I'm not sure you can 100% say that because, you know, uh, the NFLPA has, has got, secured this system where a neutral arbitrator decides first. So I think in the NFLPA's view, and they may be right about this, they may be wrong, but they believe that especially in the first case, maybe Roger Goodell would be reluctant to step in and in the very first case, okay. know, throw out the neutral arbitrator's right. case and do something vastly different. Now, they may be wrong about that. That may be what happened, but 
So, so I, 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 to answer the first question, I, I know it's a cop out, but it's hard to say because we're just uh, starting a process that is a different process than we've ever seen before, and it's not the NFL's decision. Uh, it's not the NFL, it's never been the NFLPA's decision, but it's sort of not their decision. It will be decision first made by someone else and then come back to Roger Goodell. So, uh, but I do think that, that, that at this point, you definitely have to consider it well within the realm of possibility that Deshaun Watson doesn't play at all this season. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that that's what it will be, uh, but, but you have to certainly consider it in the realm of possibility. And, you know, going back to what you said about the Browns, I mean, this goes back to, to remember when that process started and, and, and everybody just, once there were no criminal charges, you saw not just the Browns, but a handful of teams jump in and say, you know, that's the, that, that means we go after him. That means it just becomes a football decision. And it seemed hasty at the time. And, you know, how, you still had all these cases pending. And, and, and then the Browns said, well, we did our homework. And it turns out, well, they never spoke to a single victim. <laughs> no, they didn't uh, do anything. A single accuser. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't want to say anything. But a single accuser uh, at any point along this process. So it, it just seemed like that, that and not just the Browns, but every team that went after Watson was really quick to sort of throw all of this aside and say, no criminal charges, that means let's go after him. And, you know, if it takes a guaranteed $230 million contract to get it done, that's what we'll do. It's about football. And, you know, that, that just seemed premature, and, and, and the Browns may end up, there, there may be a price to be paid for that. They're certainly paying it now in some way with the public reaction, and they may pay it, you know, even more with what we see happens in terms of the football implications of it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you it's a fascinating, to me, it's completely fascinating. And I, I'm, I'm always at, at that point where you're telling me there's 24 lawsuits? Are they all made up? Are they all made up? So anyway, thank you, Mark. Mark Baskey, boys and girls. We'll take a break. Uh, we will come back with email and jingle on Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. I could do that. Just, <laughs> just fabulous. So, so, so great. fabulous. You want to do the Bethesda Bagel yet? We got the bagel sandwiches today. Yes. Very excited about that. All you need to do is go to BethesdaBagels.com for the location in the D.C. area nearest you, then pop on in, and you'll be thrilled. And just about does it for us today. Before we get to the mailbag, let me just say, what's the matter with the car I'm driving? Can't you tell that it's out of style? Should I get a set of white wall tires? Are you going to cruise the Miracle Mile? Nowadays, you can't be too sentimental. Your best bets are true, baby, blue, continental, hot funk, cool punk even if it's old junk it's still rock and roll to me billy joel hicksville long island thanks to our guests today mark maskey chuck culpepper and thanks to today's sponsors progressive and sunday remember you can listen to us on apple Podcasts, spotify google play and odyssey if you catch up through apple please leave us a review from kevin burke in chicago and this refers back to something that we talked about after the belmont stakes Okay. The owner of the horse that won the Belmont Stakes, Mo Donegal, the oh. owner of that horse. Right. While listening to Monday's show, you and Chuck Culpepper were discussing the Belmont Stakes and the owner of the winning horse, Mike Repole, R-E-P-O-L-E, or Ripoli, I'm not sure, a.k.a. Mike from Queens. I paused and I said, wait a minute, I know that guy. He used to be my boss at Glasso, maker of vitamin water and smart water. Is this a semi-DA moment? In addition to being the latest Belmont winner, I thought you might find it interesting to learn some other fun facts about this guy. Mike and his partners have created and sold three brands to the Coca-Cola company for a total of approximately $6 billion. <laughs> vitamin water, smart water, and body armor sports drink. Mike also successfully built, created, and sold Pirate's Booty Snacks. Oh, yeah. He's a die-hard St. John's basketball fan and alum and has been known to be spotted on the bench next to the head coaches. 
He recently donated $50 million to cancer research on Long Island in the name of his grandmother called Nona's Garden Foundation. He isn't just Mike from Queens. He may be one of the most interesting men in the world. That's, that's amazing. That's something. From Tim Cree in Fort Collins, Colorado, speaking of today. Monday is my daughter's ninth birthday. When's a good time for her to call and tell you about it? <laughs> Just so you know, the theme of her birthday is mermaids, and the party is at the pool, so you might want to have some good mermaid-related <laughs> anecdotes for her. Thanks in advance. From Spencer Thompson in Boston, Massachusetts. So it wasn't a flight, but I'm only 27, and I haven't been flying and able to recognize famous people for all that long, so give me a break. Back in 2003, when I was eight, my dad took me to the Quail Hollow Club to see what was then called the Wachovia Championship. We sat behind, we set up behind Seven Green. Immediately, Phil Mickelson hit a ball over the green, which landed right in front of us. He and Bones walked to their ball and prepared to hit one of his famous flop shots. The crowd around me was enthralled, and all I could think of was, wow, those are some nice-looking wedges. Maybe if I touch them, I'll chip as well as Phil. I reached out, I grabbed his 56, and no one seemed to notice, not even my dad. The next weekend, when I'm hitting flop shots on the practice green at Gaston Country Club, and I'm trying to channel my best like Mike energy, but instead nearly decapitated a couple eating dinner on the at the patio. Clearly just touching his clubs wasn't enough to ingratiate me with the chipping gods, but hey, there's still time to run up a $10 million gambling tab. It's wonderfully made. As is this. From Andrew Currier. A long time back, I was sitting at a London hotel bar. Next to me was a rock band lamenting about how they were looking for a drummer. I mentioned I have a friend who's a drummer. We call him Stumpy. I added that bad luck seems to follow him around. They seemed overly interesting. It's right out of Stumpy Joe Peeps. Peeps. Yeah, Stumpy Peeps. It's, <laughs> it's out of the, the Rob Reiner movie. The Spinal Tap. Yeah, yes. it's just great. From James Fleming. I wish I hadn't been somewhat late to the party with this. I hope Tony can still use it. If you knew Lucy, you'd understand the outpouring of love that followed her music being played on the show. Lucy Koplansky, I've had my David Aldrich moment. This long-time loyal little can tell you Lucy is not only a great singer-songwriter, but a great psychologist, too. And how do I know? In the early 1990s, Lucy and I interned together at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center in Manhattan, two members of a great six-intern team at the St. Luke's site. Like her, I was an ex-musician, musician, though I had nothing like our talent. So we bonded over that commonality in addition to the joys and travails of an excellent but demanding internship. She was a delightful presence with a great sense of humor, but I wasn't surprised when she returned to music, made many great albums, and became an esteemed artist on the singer-songwriter circuit. When we'd see each other after that return, we joked that now she'd gotten the whole psychology thing out of her system by taking five years to get a doctorate and complete a grueling internship, she could go back to what she really loved. She's a soulful, multi-talented person who brings love and intelligence to all her endeavors. I strongly encourage all littles to see her live and buy her records to stream her music. She's an artist. By the way, given this opportunity, I'd like to ask to be named the official forensic psychologist Ooh. of the Tony Kornheiser show. Sometime down the line, I'll tell you of my brush with the great Abby Lowell in that capacity. No surprise, he did not disappoint. <laughs> Jim Fleming Garrett Park. That's Garrett. great. Um, from Jojo Garofalo. On my way to work today, I was passed by a truck that said TK's Fire Protection. I was just wondering if you had taken upon a new business venture. <laughs> And if, it, and if so, is it more profitable than Chatter was? I'll wait by the phone for your call, JoJo from Nashville. <laughs> JoJo. From Derek Brown in Akron, Ohio. I'm wearing jeans today. I hate wearing jeans. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> from Jay Covington Thompson in Lexington, South Carolina. La Cheeserie from Montreux, Switzerland. That phrase sounds more authentic from the land of Swiss and Gruyere. After dipping my toes in Lake Geneva, my wife asked me why I put my socks and shoes on left, left, right, right. And I replied, Dr. Kornheiser. <laughs> she harumphed and walked away. From Kirsten at La Plata. That's in Maryland. Let's hope it before the earthquake. Yes. <laughs> Jake and not stir. Right. Just like to say that you uh, know you're too deep into littlehood when you're listening to Chuck Todd provide first-class commentary on a primetime congressional hearing, and all you can think of is he's such a degenerate <laughs> gambler. From Kobe in Baltimore. 60 me emails a day? Wow. I've started eating blackberries. I like them. I do not like cottage cheese. You're lost. <laughs> From John Vanjoski in Potomac, Maryland. First time, long time. I'm watching the NCAA track and field championships on ESPN. This is last week. And in the first 1500 meter heat, Emily Mackey from Binghamton won the heat and qualified for the final on Saturday. I thought you'd like to give her a shout out. I wish I had seen this earlier. But, you know. But congratulations, yes. too. I got one more. And this is an old one. This is from February. Okay. But I, so I sort of... I back in the archives. Yeah. Yeah. It's from Ron Tkach. Here's two in your wheelhouse. 
I grew up and currently live in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, home of Perry Como and Bobby Vinton, whom my mom went to high school with. <laughs> also in fifth and sixth grade at Borland Manor Elementary School, I had a classmate named Demi Guyans. You would know her better as Demi Moore. At the end of sixth grade, before moving to the junior high, we hand handmade autograph books for our classmates. To, you hand over the autograph books for classmates to sign. My best friend at the school, Bob Lawrence, had Demi sign his. She wrote, to a very sweet and cute boy, remember me always. Oh, he has. <laughs> that book is still prominently displayed in his house. If you're out on your bike tent, everyone, as always, do wear white. I hate bananas. I hate pumpkins. I hate watermelon. I like olive. I love comfy <laughs> pears. I hate squirrels. All right, so that is the Monday, June 20th episode of the Tony Kornheiser Show. We are flying over Greenland. Extremely foggy and stormy, apparently, in Greenland today on Monday, June 20th. We're going to continue our flight here. And we are going to play today's episodes of the Sharp and Benning Show from Omaha, Nebraska. We'll probably be talking a lot about the College World Series, which is going on in Omaha right now, and uh, other national sports. So here we go. Incident. With me from a car, winds and fires, he shoots and scores! Oh, hell, hell! It's a power play goal, his second special teams goal of the period, and the Tampa Bay Lightning are drinking from a fountain that's pouring like an avalanche, that's coming down the mountain. The touchdown is good, so is the extra point. The Avalanche again in the 2022 Stanley Cup playoffs have put up seven. This is Travis. There's a deep drive to left field. Back this one sails. They're not going to catch that one. Out of the ballpark, a three-run home run. He just pounded one onto Waveland Avenue. It's three-nothing Braves here at the top of the first inning. Hanging it's all right. Hander fires and a swing and a fly ball left field. Back it goes by the wall. And it is gone into the monster seats. Three-run homer, Christian Vasquez. And the Red Sox have broken it open. They lead it 6-1. Freddie Freeman on deck. Quantrill set. Taylor leading from third. Here's the pitch. Fly ball left field. Well hit. Juan going back to the wall. And it is gone. A home run. Trey Turner with his ninth home run of the year. RBIs 48 and 49. And right now, the Dodgers with a 3-1 to lead. Back in the first, high fly ball to left. Bellow going back, still chasing back, reaches up, and that ball is gone! Kevin Graham! High fly ball, deep left field, and he's going back, hooks up, all gone! Lamana goes yard, and the Irish have finally cracked the Cade Horton safe. It's five, two suitors. All right, three days down, game four, day four downtown. A little uh, deep south cooking later tonight in the College World Series. Golf had a great weekend. NBC Sports covering the event. Not necessarily so. Nobody had a better Saturday night than the uh, Colorado Avalanche. Good Monday morning, David. Damn right, yes. Good morning. It is sharp and betting in the morning on a uh, Monday as uh, we work through the record heat for another day of the College World Series. Which, in one bracket, I think Oklahoma is going to be tough to knock out. Oklahoma has been muy impressive in the first two games that they have played, including dispatching, as you heard there last night, uh, Notre Dame 6-2 to two downtown at the Chuck. Yeah, probably given the level of their competition. Uh, they played the cleanest so far. I mean, no disrespect to Arkansas. That got out of hand early, and I think Stanford knew. All right, we got to live to play another day. But if you look at, like... Because I didn't feel like Texas played poorly in the opener. You know, Bertrand was being Bertrand, and I didn't feel like they actually played poorly. I, A&M didn't play well early. Gave that one away against OU. They bounced back. 
Oh, he's been way consistent. That 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 top of the deal. And shoot, both the the popular picks in each of the brackets. You yeah. know, Stanford's gonna have to stave off uh, elimination today. Texas and Stanford could be two in the queue. Yeah, this is uh, so wide open, and we've been saying that, but we narrowed it down. Texas, Stanford, maybe things will settle down when you get here. Not the case. Runs are up. Home runs are up. The four teams that went on the road to get here in the first and second weekend went four and zero. Oh. I mean, national seeds went zero oh and four in the first two days, and now Oklahoma. The Oklahoma Sooners are in a great spot. They are a win away from playing in the championship series. And now, either tonight, Arkansas or Ole Miss is going to join them. Uh, but Texas did not see them going 0-2. But the problem is, the big Hispanic Titanic came here and did not play like he did all season long or last year. Yeah. And the heart of the order just did not get base hits. That's that's going to sit if I'm Texas for a long time. One, you got knocked out by your rival. Boy, they, those two families hate each other. And you went two in the queue and no, didn't play anywhere near like you have shown over the course of the last month. Yeah, I guess that's, if you're ranking them, the, the disappointing offense, because you'd hit it all year. But man, did their bullpen get exposed again. That had been their Achilles all year. And uh, the middle of the bullpen was bad. It was bad again. Just couldn't, just couldn't keep it close. They couldn't get any clutch hits. And it would have been interesting to see them get on, because that felt like when they got on the bases, I mean, they were aggressive. And that, that's the, really the only thing that kept them in against Notre Dame was aggressive on the base pass, and I, I felt like that was a little bit better, but they just couldn't get the big hit. You just felt those all the air leave the chuck when Melendez struck out with the base. Yep. And it's they, like... They were so bad with runners in scoring position yesterday. Not good. And uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically a little sloppy defensively, too. Uh, I, I, for all the Texas A&M fans that are listening, they're like... <laughs> Because there is a pure hate. And, and, and it's, you know, if you're, uh, I would say if you're probably like a teenager, I was having a discussion with someone from Texas A&M. And we, I said, tell me more about this rivalry. Because in my mind, it's all built off of football. And he said, yeah, if you're, if you're like a teenager, you don't understand the full extent of Texas A&M Texas because you haven't had football. He goes, when they start playing again in football, this rivalry, which is pretty healthy across other sports, will ratchet up even tenfold. I mean, look at Micah Dallas is the pitcher yesterday for Texas A&M. And talk about a guy that grinded on a, on a hot day. Yeah. Didn't have his best Felt stuff. Felt like he'd be the key. But he found a way to, to get outs and to preserve a Texas A&M bullpen because now you're in a loser's bracket. And, you know, you're going to have to manage your way through that with all of your pitching. So he comes out of the game and, you know, the game got lopsided and it was pretty much decided before you got to the seventh inning. 10-2, he comes out of the dugout and him and a couple of other teammates immediately horns out. I'm like, wow, this rivalry is this is a sweet rivalry. But Texas goes home, and that is a major disappointment for uh, Texas because you're knocked out. You're not only two in the queue, but you get knocked out by your uh, rival. Now, tonight. They did a heck of a – and M did a heck of a job bouncing back because they were, they were bad uh, in the opener. And for them to come back and be steady against a rival where emotions, you're already – your back's against the wall. You played like trash for the most part. And their approach yesterday, I mean, they, I guess offensively it is who they've been all year, you know, working counts deep and not swinging at first pitches. And good with two strikes. They just grind them. And for them to, like, rally emotionally after that opening debacle and it's your rival, I've, that was like, hmm, a pretty tough team, Miller. Yeah, you got to throw strikes. So there are teams that will grind at bats, and especially, as you alluded to, Texas A&M. Uh, you know, they will... They will not swing at bad pitches. So they don't even swing at the first pitch. So you're going to have to throw strikes because your pitch count is going to be ratcheted up. And that's what we see. For for example, the two teams playing today, you get Connor Nolan pitches a gem against Stanford and his offense comes alive. And then you get Dylan DeLucia or Ole Miss strikes out 10. Starting pitchers like Oklahoma DeLucia is 2-0. Oklahoma Absolutely. is 2-0. Because you've had Bennett, and then last night you had Horton, who have been magnificent and have given you 5-6, and they put you in a position to win. But a lot of these games have been decided fairly early. We haven't had any close games so far. Uh, but Oklahoma is impressive. And Oklahoma, I looked up FanDuel this morning. They are the favorite 
They are the betting favorite right now, followed by Arkansas, who plays Ole Miss tonight in what should be an electric atmosphere. The blood alcohol level will be through the roof, I imagine, for the Ole Miss and Arkansas fans. Yeah, I believe those two teams are one, two, respectively, in Rocco's Jello Shot CWS chart that they are keeping. It is indeed a healthy lead for Arkansas, who I believe at this juncture is up. Oh, boy, where was that? They were up a couple of hundred, maybe. Yeah. It's like 2,700 to 2,400 in terms of jello shots consumed. So, Shane, you would love this. Uh, they're doing a jello shot challenge. First of all, they're selling them for 450 dollars What would it take, 50 cents to make? Yeah. Yeah, may maybe. So you got to figure a pack of jello is probably, what, like $1.69, $1.99? Yeah. 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 You know, most people... Plus the cheap... Uh, is it's vodka, right? Yeah, most people outside of the College World Series have no idea where this place is. I mean, I, I, I've been there a couple of times. It's hardly ever full. But for the College World Series, this is a genius idea because they're getting all this free publicity. I heard ESPN was talking about it last night. And so people go in there and, you know, you, you say, I'm an Arkansas fan. Give me five shots or whatever oh, yeah. it is. And so they're running a total board. Arkansas was running away from it. They, they, away they from are. It's 34-16 to 27-63. So 27-63 is Ole Miss, right? Yeah. Okay, that's all you need to know about tonight. Yeah. you got Arkansas and Ole Miss fans. So I've heard Arkansas fans, like some people are going in there and go, I'll buy 100. Just spread them around. Anybody that's in the bar, but Arkansas gets credit. I mean, this is a great idea. I mean, they're getting all kinds of publicity. But Shane, how come you're not there? And money. Yeah, so th it, This is right up your alley. So it's based off of the... A fan, you know, the, being the fan base representing the purchase. Nice. So uh, that's nice. I like Stanford, which is why you see Stanford with ninety-three. Oh yeah. And they don't have a lot of people in town. Yeah. They don't particularly strike me as the as the folk that are just getting it in too. So uh, tonight, you tonight will be wild. You'll be calling the Hogs, and you got Hottie Toddy. Uh, that's a winner's bracket game. Later today is Stanford and Auburn. Not super sexy. But Stanford, they have to bounce back in a uh, big way to stay alive on uh, day number four of the College World Series. Uh, the heat, it's, it is what it is. It's going to be hot again today. Uh, I've heard, you know, the, the bleachers have been subdued a little bit with the heat. And it also, is what it is. you know, you don't get the rowdy crowd that is out there that buys the $10 GA ticket. Uh, you also, I'm, 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 people come to us and they say, hey, can you talk about blank, blank, blank? We told you last week that there are parking meters near the stadium that charge you 30 bucks. Okay? The, the highest parking I saw, uh, it's pretty reasonable. So uh, we're going down Cumming Street, when you get to about 18th. Yeah, Cumming, just, just before the hotel. Uh, 10 bucks. Yeah, just west of the hotel. So you're probably, you know, by the time you get to the, the weekend, it might be up to 15. But that's, that's the most expensive parking I've seen. But people are at the meters where it's 12 hours for 30 bucks. You can do the math. And then people want to complain to us about the lines. Here's my tip. This is a tip that a lot of us give you if you're figuring out how to get in line. Now, now a lot of people I'm understanding are upset because of the, the time it takes with the electronic ticketing uh, and, you know, the Wi-Fi, which at times has been an issue, is go to gate four, which is near the left field corner. Very few people go all the way over there. It's on the other side of the fan fest. Go over there, and I think I've ever, every time I've seen it, there are hardly any lines over there. So I, that's our PSA for today. I'll Help take you it. navigate day four of the College World Series at the Chuck. Chuck. Yeah. Which Chuck. We, uh, we will all be together coming up at uh, 1 o'clock today. All right, coming up on the show, we will uh, dive into, I thought golf had a great weekend. The USGA won this weekend. The course was great. Your winner didn't lose it. He went and got it. It was an exciting finish. It was heartbreak for one. But Matt Fitzpatrick, who won the U.S. Amateur at the same course, Back in 2013, wins the U.S. Open. How about us singling him out to talk about? Yeah. How about? And, and he's, so we're, we're, uh, we're just, gonna, re, just studying up, like a lot of people felt like he had a good chance. So look at the guys that are close. We're going to talk a lot about Matt Fitzpatrick and, and Josh Burhau will join us coming up from uh, golf.com at about 840. There's also the guy that finished runner-up again, Will Zalatoris. And it sucks to finish runner-up again in a major. I don't think this runner-up leaves scar tissue. He's the next guy that's close. Because people have been saying that about Fitzpatrick. The way his game is, he's close in majors and he's competitive in majors. Yeah, I didn't think he, he was supposed his. to be very long either. My oh, man is longer than he was given credit for coming into this one. You know, he was, was it plus 3,000 in some places before this began, which was a little bit odd. But 
Apparently he's been working on swing speed because my man was adding length. And he was great. He hit the fairways. Now, he, he won yesterday despite a bulky putter, but he's going to have the memorable shot coming out of the fairway bunker on 18. But it's the major moment that he got on the last hole. I, I think the tournament was really, really good. The setup was good. The course looks fantastic. That is an elite U.S. Open course in Brookline. So you weren't talking about, ah, oh, the course was a mess. You know what the negative out of the weekend is? Is whatever NBC Sports was doing with their coverage of golf. Well, are you talking about like doubling up on commercials and split screen or commercials? And, and I know they, you know, they they didn't front load a lot of the days where you get a lot of your commercials out of the way. So you get towards the back end where you can have unlimited golf. But the one problem I had, and this is this is something that NBC they got exposed because. I think the consumer of golf on TV is very particular. They want to oh, see shots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that you know, the, oh, live, yeah. the live tour was actually pretty good because what did they do? They showed you shots. Okay, they showed you a lot of golf shots. Well, I don't know if that made it good, but that part was good. NBC Sports would show you a shot, then they would go to a three-minute commercial break, then they would come back. But they got exposed yesterday because they came back and they showed the leaderboard and Scheffler had already made a putt. And so they had changed the score as people were coming back, and you didn't get to see that. They're like, oh, you know, they were just trying to sneak that past you. But the golf fan consuming, and especially the amount of golf fans that watch the majors, man, when you're not good in the presentation, I, I, before you ever get to what's going on in the towers, your presentation, if it's not good, the golf fan will come after you. And, and we want to see shots. We want to see shots. And it was a problem all weekend. I, I said on Friday... You were doing the remote control gymnastics. Peacock, USA Network, NBC. You were all over the place trying to, to get the uh, U.S. Open. But one of the in things the end, that, it turned out pretty well. One of the things I actually did like, though, was how the leaderboards the, on TV, the overlay, updated almost immediately. You know, they'd highlight it, golfer, the score would flip. They'd move you, like, real time. So uh, that part was, like, one of the things I did. Like, I could do without the split screen and the dual coverage. I, that was, well, that was, especially for a guy like me, like that is just not fit. It's, it's a lot going on. You know, we've talked about, you know, like the soccer fan, they're very particular about who's calling the match. You know, if how good they are, if they understand the sport of soccer. Remember Gus Johnson got crushed when they put him on soccer. So from what's coming out of the commentary and the play-by-play, I think the soccer fan is pretty intense. But when you turn down the sound and you're just looking at the presentation, that's where the golf fan takes over. All of our other sports, those are our, those are common sports to cover. So we get to see hockey, which, you know, both TNT and ESPN this year, I think have done a really good job in the presentation of hockey. And then, oh, by the way, there's the studio show, especially with TNT, that was fantastic. The other sports are natural that you cover and you present. But yesterday, on that NBC, had a really rough day in presenting that uh, at the U.S. Open. Mm. Uh, but Matt Fitzpatrick saved the day with uh, his win as he shot a uh, 68. And on 18, we had some drama. I like majors, Damon, where it's not you lost the major. The person that won is because someone in front of them fell apart. This was a case where the person in front of you that ended up winning, they went out and they won the tournament. And look, at they, they overcame the number one player in the world, and there's no doubt that Scotty Scheffler is the number one player, and then Zalatoris. I love his And John Rahm was around for a while as well, and then Rory was in there. His personality uh, for Scheffler. It, for all intents and purposes, he too seems like a, a pretty cool dude to hang out with, especially his uh, his personality under when he's stressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he seems like he's pretty all right. I, I, you know, he's number one for a reason. He is pretty, he's probably, pretty steely. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, also on the show, Jimmy Watkins will uh, join us. And then Aaron Fitt. Uh, saw Fitty uh, yesterday from D1 Baseball. That whole crew is in town covering the uh, College World Series. We'll get his thoughts on the first three days. Your thoughts as well. Your experience inside, outside of the ballpark. We can talk to baseball as well as we're six games in. Oklahoma is 2-0. and oh. They are a win away from playing for the championship. And whoever wins tonight between Ole Miss and Arkansas will join them at 2 and 0. Oh. It is a uh, elimination game today at 1 here on the zone between Stanford and Auburn. Which Stanford that was that was probably the startling thing of 
this weekend is Stanford and Alabama, Absolutely. which was really bad. Uh, he's trending in the wrong direction. Yeah, they got they got beat seventeen to two. So they've they've had some success with elimination games, and now they got to play a lot of elimination games. Four, the four, four in a row. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna get to Arkansas and uh, Oklahoma, but we will definitely get we we'll get some hammered people. I mean, that, that could be just ratcheted up. I I, I wouldn't be yeah, surprised if there's people right. in the parking lot now tailgating. Yeah, and it's and not until 6 o'clock, too, so it'll be like, oh, we'll have all we got day, your bias all day to get it in. All right, there's David. I'm yes, Gary. Indeed. Shane here is, uh, well, sharp betting in the morning, kicking off a uh, Monday. We'll get into uh, also uh, tonight is game three of the Stanley Cup final, if it matters, after Colorado put up a touchdown on Tampa Bay and pitched a shut get into as the series shifts to uh, Tampa. All of that and much more. And you're always welcome to join us. Your thoughts on the entire weekend. We'll talk off with you. 951-1620. You can always email us in the Equitable Bank inbox at Gary Dam at 1620thezone.com or on the JTEC Construction Zone Twitter feed at Gary Sharp 1620 at David Benning. Uh, the roof freeze. John Higgins Weather Guard. The lineup today. We're talking golf. Josh Burhow will join us at 840. Jimmy Watkins from the Omaha World Herald at 9. And then as we mentioned, Eric Fitt from D1 Baseball. Welcome to all you're in town for the College World Series. Glad to have you on 1620 The Zone. Target has All right, we had to change the weather from live weather in Greenland because it's so cloudy to mostly cloudy here, so we can at least see some things while we're flying. We continue on with the Sharp and Benning show from today, June 20th. Behind the goal line with Alex Newhook for a Koski and Brendan Chisholm. Game three of the Stanley Cup Final tonight in uh, Tampa. The series shifts to the home of the Lightning. I don't know if it'll matter because Colorado is 10-0 in the postseason against everyone not named the St. Louis Blues. That was a juggernaut dominating, very rarely seen in the Stanley Cup Final performance to win 7 nothing. Oh, it's a juggernaut! 7 nothing. Yeah, they're... Oh, yeah! They're, 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 they're pretty good. That's and the whole water's wet world. Here's the thing, though. What they do well, it is very, very... I thought, remember I said, well, you know, there are a lot... Until you see them firsthand, it's kind of hard, but you, then you can gauge it. Maybe you can, you know, try to possess the puck a little longer, hold it in the neutral zone, you know, be a little bit more deliberate. Those were just suggestions, because all that's out the window when they get to skate. I mean, just... They're just more. It's it's strange to say in in hockey because you don't hear it a ton. We used to say like skilled. Colorado's athletic. And you watch them on their skates and the moves and the body control. And yeah, it's total skill handling the puck and going tape to tape. But they're silly. I mean, it's truly an average. The choo choo train. It is. It is truly an average. They just come at you in ways. And people are, I mean, look at seven goals and their depth of who's scoring. I mean, they look at look at Nathan McKenna. How many goals does he have? And he's one of your best players. Yeah. I mean, they have so much depth. They're, they're really, really good, and it may not matter because I, I think Tampa Bay good is good, good. But Colorado is on a different level. So people talk about their offense and they talk about their speed. But they're, they're guys that are on the blue line. I mean, Kale McCarr is, is the front runner for the Con Smythe. I mean, he's on a whole different planet. In the way that he is playing, and They're if you're looking at head to head, who we thought was going to be one two with, he's he's clearly out playing. Yeah. There, and he's in the you know you you had Lindstrom, Keith, and Hedman have been the run of great blue liners in the NHL. McCarr is like right there with them at the at this stage in his career. I, I don't know what gets into their way. I mean. They're not going to blow a 2 0 lead. Now, Tampa Bay will respond tonight, but will it be enough? Because that's a really good hockey team that's coming from Denver to Tampa. And Shane, uh, I, hey, by the way, uh, you are you have an invite to the Avalanche uh, Victory Parade by somebody that lives in Denver that we all know. 
Really? Yes. That's awesome. Uh, so you'll either be there this upcoming weekend or maybe early next week. That'd be sweet. You know, McCarr, he looks like he's like 17. He's got the babies. He's not very old. Yeah, he's, he's just... He's 27. Yeah, just a, I mean, just a young pup. very old. Just a young pup, but... My man can skate his brains out. Gosh, is he skilled. Well, and he's fantastic at both zones. I mean, he's not just a, a defenseman. Look, he got a shorthanded goal the other night. I mean, he, he rushes the puck. He, he's everything you want in a defenseman. And he's going to be around for a long time. Now, there are some players on that Colorado roster that have played themselves out of Denver because of how well they played in the postseason, and you're not going to be able to afford them. But that team is that team is absolutely loaded. I, it's If you don't follow hockey, 7 nothing in a Stanley Cup final game is jaw-dropping. And, and, and remember, that's the two-time defending Stanley Cup champions with an incredible goalie who hasn't been so good the first two games. And I don't know what will get out of him tonight. I imagine he'll bounce back, stand on his head, but again, will that be enough? I, I don't know if it's enough against Colorado. Because that is a juggernaut. As the kids, you, you as the kids say, they're an absolute wagon. Yeah, you don't want to panic, right? They, they're supposed to win at home. And you did almost steal game one. So we'll see how much of the championship pedigree seeps back into Tampa. Because, you know, Cooper and that ones, they've obviously been super successful. And again, Colorado was at home. You kind of expect them to go up to go. You don't expect to get both ways so. Well, the one thing that Colorado does really nicely that rarely gets mentioned is they don't give in to the to the when when they when they're up and then and the other team starts to uh, try to uh, you know put the hits on, try to do the manhandling, that sort of stuff. They don't give in to that for the uh, for the penalties. They just play smart hockey. That's what they do. People do try to rough them up. You just can't, you can't catch them, so the penalties look so egregious. You're not ever in good position. You can't be subtle. Very few scoring chances for a team. I mean, you let it kind of, you let, I mean, it is, yeah, it is, uh, they're, they're silly sometimes when they're rolling. So that'll be game three uh, tonight, the Stanley Cup Finals. We have baseball later today here on the show. Uh, the shows will start from Baseball Village coming up, but we're done at 10. We have Stanford and Auburn, they play at one, an elimination game. And then at six o'clock tonight, uh, get ready for some Wu Pig Sui, Arkansas and Ole Miss Oklahoma is 2-0, and and with their pitching, <laughs> and hitting, and, of course, their defense. Oklahoma, our uh, Ole Miss fan base, they won't have to take a backseat tonight. Uh, Ole Miss is playing pretty well. That that game, for me, is virtually a toss. They're uh, unbeaten in the uh, postseason. Virtually a toss. The uh, sentimental team for me would be Arkansas. Uh, man, they were 17-2. Did not see that coming. At one point, that game was 1-1. Yeah, and Stanford scored in the first inning. And that was it for it was 1-1, and then it was 17-2, five and a half hours uh, later. All right, 6-4. Yeah, the... not hoping to get one of those. That's for sure. Now, I mean, only two of the three days has the night game started late. Yeah, what did we get last night, like 625? Uh, 6.37. I was, yeah. uh, I was pulling into my garage at 11.05. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they... Uh, the pace of uh, play is kind of interesting. Of, of what... <laughs> Walkie-talkie. The, the gamemanship of... Like, for example, here, here here's the thing yesterday with Texas and Texas A&M. So, David Pierce, the head coach of Texas, is their base coach. He comes and has a meeting with his hitter. Then that goes on for a while, and they don't break it up. They let it kind of linger. And then after that's Grand done, Grace. Jim Schlossnagel comes out of the Texas A&M dugout to make a pitch couldn't make a pitching change while they were talking to the hitter. He waited until they were done and then walked out to the mound and made a pitching change. And it drags and it drags and it drags. Gives you guys plenty of time to talk to one another. Yeah. Yep. Well, you have, you know, Bishop gets agitated. He's great. He's funny. I'm trying to figure out, so does anybody know? I mean, obviously folks were working yesterday, but Anybody that was back here at the mothership kind of manning the stations know what happened to our poll out here? Uh, Does anybody have a story of why this huge light right outside our driveway next to the the NRG media display board is on the ground shattered? Oh, my God. Whatever hit that pole, 
has to not be in good shape. You can see it. Shane took a picture of it. And he tweeted it out this morning. Does it look like it fell over Shane, or did someone hit it? it How did like somebody he... get their car move that quickly if they hit that thing? That look... car had to be... I'd say it looks like somebody hit it, and then it was probably moved a little bit. I mean, because it's kind of displaced. You, you would think some of it would have ended up on the road and wasn't. You'd think some of it might have been in the... Uh, you know, in the parking lot and wasn't, so it's just kind of on the grass there, so it's kind of placed neatly there, so you would think somebody would have hit it and that it was moved a little bit by somebody. That, we don't know, and we don't know exactly what happened, but somebody's got we the got, answer. We got We'd cameras. Like to know. We need to be watching those things. They've been like television. Looks like it fell over. Yeah, I don't know about that. It's It's been removed from the ground. That didn't just fall. Then how did somebody not, like, do more damage? I don't know. I do want to know what hit it. Because that can't be in good shape either. All of a sudden, Dodge Street went dead. Okay, so I'm scanning here. You know, uh, the night after this weekend, there was a lot of debauchery downtown again, as expected with the College World Series. Yeah, the, place, uh, the place stinks. Sounds like, let's see here, uh, according to Omaha Scanner on Twitter, uh, there was a large fight at 11th and Howard this morning. Uh, police wanted more cars and pepper bowls. They're making PA announcements. Oh, medics were in route. Uh, let's see, what else happened downtown? Um, disturbance in the old market. Oh, well, the gang unit was called. Uh, fireworks were set <gasps> off last night downtown. Uh, the old mattress factory, the off-duty police officer, wanted uh, help because there was a highly intoxicated party that they were arrested. I'm shocked. Shocker. It should... They should find out which fan base they were representing. Unless there are a lot of people just come, like when the games are over, someone must put out an alert or they're following. Because the last couple of nights, leaving the parking lot, Lot D, there are a lot of people that are coming into the parking lot yeah, to go and party over in Baseball Village. Late nights? A lot, lot, lot of people with a lot more s stamina than myself. The abacary going on. All right, I'm scanning here. I don't see any accident at... Uh, 50th and Dodge. Maybe uh, Gary has an answer for us. Good morning, Gary. Fantastic first name. Hello. Good morning, gentlemen. Gary, first thing, great call on the weekend. I listened to your broadcast on 1620 the whole weekend. Thank you, sir. And, and to answer your question, yes, the car, there was an accident there, I believe, um, Saturday morning. So something, it had to be an extremely large vehicle. Do yeah, you know? It was a vehicle. Do you I know? Get, they had it blocked off in Dodge. They had to go over uh, to um, come up from Baker's. But yeah, some Nice vehicle hit it, but it was kind of blocked off. Hey, so what what time was that? Was that about, do you shop uh, early? I was going to the grocery store about 9 o'clock on Saturdays. Came up from Baker's on Santa Creek, and so it happened somewhere early. Wow, okay. Right. Yeah. What the hey, it's, you, know, you drive around Omaha every day like I do, and you see probably about 15 bowls down across the interstate. It's, so, it's, a, it's amazing, <laughs> man. Nothing unusual. <laughs> Just, like, nothing unusual. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, that thing got smoked. What uh, pretty? Let's see here. There was there was a high speed chase through downtown Omaha that ended at forty second. I thought they weren't doing those. Let's see. You, you don't do high speed chases anymore, do you? I don't think so. I don't think it's advised. Wow. I mean, if we're gonna have somebody hit our light pole, can't we get on Omaha Scanner? Maybe they were recovering from the night before. If it happened early Saturday morning, maybe... Is it, uh, isn't the mayor still uh, involved with that? Yeah. See, yeah. Lock the mayor. I mean, I had a car hit me, and I was disappointed I didn't get into Omaha Scanner on New Year's Eve. <laughs> now now so, somebody hits our uh, light pole out here, and we can't even get on Omaha Scanner? It is what it is. I think I smoke. If that was Saturday, how's it still down? Uh... Well, probably because nobody noticed. I think the landlord has to come and pick it up. Oh, the city doesn't do that? Oh, I think it's isn't it, it's on our property, isn't it, Shane? Isn't that like our we're in charge of that? <laughs> Dang! Now I'm like really curious. What after Gary's call? Like I want to see pictures. And, sa and sa reports. Saturday morning, I thought when he meant morning, he'd have meant like two a.m. or three a.m. But. Gary's probably not rolling Hey, down maybe they were TV. mesmerized by our uh, dot matrix uh, information board here. Yeah, yeah, every, hit, every hit, every play. About covering the CWS College World Series, 1620. So. About, like, I would say about 20 years ago, 
when I was coming into work here, and this was back on the original unsportsmanlike conduct, a, a, somebody had ran a red light, or a stop sign, and so what I did was, instead of getting hit in the side, the driver's side, I veered off to the right and I hit one of those poles. And it was down, it was down for a couple of days. So, I mean, it probably takes a couple of days for the city or whoever to come out and get it. I would assume it's the city. Uh, I'm also looking, so there was an incident in the parking lot. Be aware, David. Uh, some guy that was parked like a couple of cars down from me looked like somebody turned the corner too quick and took off the front of their grill and mm -hmm. then just left. Like that guy's not going to be happy when he comes out. Of yeah, the folks don't him. follow the arrows over they just kind of do what they want. And it is a short turn. Like, if you're leaving to come in and you get traffic yeah. running north-south, like, just leaving through the gates, yeah. kind of a free-for-all. Well, and I feel yeah. like, you know, they, they have uh, the... I guess Not that I'm right. complaining about having I, parking. I guess they, you call them Mecca people that are directing traffic out, and then they turn it over to the police. Do they like those names? Can we call them Mecca? Mecca people? I, I think they're... Well, I mean, what, they're Mecca people. Mecca people. Okay. Then they turn it over to OPPD... Who, I think that would be miserable to be on traffic duty, directing traffic. You down with OPPD? Because everybody is upset at you. Yeah. And you, you know, you're waving, you're trying to get people in the right spot. You know, and then, oh, by the way, you're in the middle of traffic, hoping that somebody doesn't run you over. <laughs> traffic! Shane, this is, uh, this is our, our quest for the rest of the morning. We want to see the police report on what happened here. So, like, there's got to be a good story here. When I hit mine, it just it looked like it just knocked it over. So there was a possibility that they just came out and just put it back up. So, but this one out here is destroyed. I mean, they're going to have to obviously put a brand new one in or just not have one out there. What do you think the car looks like that hit it? That's what I'm saying. It had to be a fairly big vehicle. Especially for it to not still be there sometime later. Highly doubt they just put the keys back in the ignition. <laughs> if they did, it was probably, you know truck maybe a semi well so i'm gonna play traffic guy here today uh we have had now was that was that bad accident last week as well two weeks yeah okay we had a deer run across the street right by our station beware between 52nd and 50th and dodge it has not been good to folks the last couple of months so and here's another thing i know that when people drive by here they want to be able to see us in the studio you can't see us okay so don't worry about slowing down or whatever we can, can see, see them yeah, if we, we can, can see, see over the old satellite dish. Yeah, but you can't, uh, like, I've, I've driven by here a couple of times uh, and tried to, you know, look in, and you can't. We're, uh, what do you call that? Uh, you know, not shade. Uh, Blocked! Obstructed? Tinted, uh, we have tinted windows. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have tinted, tinted windows. Uh, if uh, anybody has pictures or would like to share crazy uh, theories on what happened to our light pole with the accident, we would love to uh, hear 650. We'll talk uh, more on the U.S. Open. The part of, of Will Allen Torres, who is going to be the next in line, or at least you think he's going to be the next in line. He is close. Matt Fitzpatrick broke through and got his. Uh, Will Allen Torres came up short yesterday. He was very gracious because that cannot be easy. We talk a lot about winners, but there is the heartbreak of a near miss and how you deal with it because you can lose once, bump. That's back-to-back -back majors where he has been a runner-up. And you know, in, in golf, majors change your life. Just If you just have one even, yeah, it completely sure. changes your uh, life. Also, Jimmy Watkins will uh, stop by. And Aaron Fitt with his thoughts on the first three days of the College World Series and what will happen today. Who will join Oklahoma at 2-0? Will it be Ole Miss? Lewis. Or will it be Arkansas? That's the game tonight at 6. That has a, the makings of a really, really good game. Just give us a close game, please. <laughs> We've had three days and we haven't a clue. Hey, sports. Look how long it took you to get a lead change. Sports, can we Didn't have... happen until Texas, Texas yeah. Sandhill. Sports, can we have a close game? No. We didn't have one in basketball. We haven't had one in baseball. Please? So what if we... Yeah, we... Well, we had the overtime game winner. But 7 nothing. yeah. Hey, my main man, Sean, he said he's funny, too. He said y'all are assuming the person made a, a report. They were drunk. They probably kept on rolling. Let's go get them. Hey, so do you think, so? and I guess you could drink at any time during the day, but <laughs> if it did happen Saturday morning, were you were you on one that early? Or, I, I mean, I guess maybe you're a third shifter, but. You want a little uh, steak and eggs? Fudge. <laughs> Bottomless mimosa at 6 a.m.? Who was doing that? All right, if so if our, if our light got a hit and run. Then, then our, our friends that are working the shops, 
somebody that comes in with some damage, I would ask them, where did you get this damage from? Yeah. That's why I never got my, that's why that scar on my forearm never closed, because when I fell through the window, I was afraid somebody would put two and two together in Lincoln. I'm like, yeah, post a nickel downtown, 14th Street. Yeah, I don't want people to make the neck. Hey, what happened to your back and your, your forearm and your shoulder? I don't know, man. Exactly, that's about how it sounded. That joker is not cut, or is not closed. Post a nickel still open, I Went there once to see if I could fit into clothes, and it was nearly impossible. Uh, no, my buddy Corey took care of me that night. I woke up on my balcony. He like put me outside. The balcony is, was wood, and it has you know it's like the pieces aren't together. So I like woke up with like lines on my skin and a neoprene sleeve and some tape, like I was getting ready to go play a game. Wow. I was like, what is? Why did I? Why does this feel like I got a shark bite in my forearm? And you didn't show up in the police report, so that's good. No, because you know what they I, I waited two days so, and it cost me a good scar hey so you know the story of that stretch in Lincoln in the 90s what every the reporters that would go to the cop shop at 9 a.m. for the police report oh and well, well, the well, well aware report, and they would scan because we had well, I was working at KLIN and Jane Monica would go to the cop shop at 9 a.m. where they would release the police report and she didn't know much about Nebraska football but she said they would sit there and like they TV people in the, the journal and the star reporters, they would go through the police report trying to recognize names of Nebraska football players. So good for you that they were able to cover that up. Well, it was, <laughs> I wasn't going to make a report. Hey, guy falls through the window laughing hysterically because he's hammered. It's pretty embarrassing. It's a good thing I was in my little 20s. All right, 653, sharp betting in the morning on a uh, Monday to kick off a, another week. Hope everybody had a great Father's Day. By the way, uh, you enjoyed time with your father or as a father or remembered your uh, father. But hope everybody had a good uh, weekend of uh, Father's Day. We're back at it. Start betting in the morning with Shane at 1620. This morning. All right, we ask questions. We're going to have a video that we're going to share. We have this happened at about... After 6 o'clock on Friday, Friday. Yeah, yeah, Friday night. Apparently the building shook after the car hit our light. Let's find this person. Hope they're well, not a P1. Well, that would, that would be okay. really unfortunate. And Or maybe it would be like a better story. What, what Conrad said, the other vehicle was missing the whole trunk. Yeah, yeah I mean, that pole is pretty sturdy. That had a... That, at that time of the night, that had just be a mess on this street. Yeah, 6 30, yeah. When I hit the one that, that I hit 20 years ago, it need the front of my car. It cost about $1,000 to get the engine re rebuilt on it. So it literally feed the front and just destroyed it. It didn't destroy the light. And I, would, I didn't even hit it very, I mean, it, I mean, I must have rolled into it maybe five miles an hour, six miles an hour, something like that. And you know, not very hard. So... Oh, Shaner. Wow. I'd be scared. Shane was so excited. I pulled up the thing. He goes, wait till you see this picture. See the light? I'm like, whoa. I got to see the car. Yeah, I know. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Uh, Cody, stay again, right there. Again, that would be a big deal. Next hour uh, coming up, we'll uh, talk a little uh, football. Uh, Nebraska had their Friday Night Lights camp. Uh, a little pass catcher from Bellevue West showed up and showed out again. Not a surprise. Uh, also, wait, did he? Uh, you know what? The, I, I did go. I had to go to the college. I, I, I got a lot of conflicting reports. I'm just going off of uh, reports by reporters, but we can share ideas. I wasn't there, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who did what. I, I'm, I'm. I waited patiently yesterday, and then I missed both calls. So it's probably my fault. Just wanted, and I was, I was specific about a couple of things too. So I. Yeah, I'm waiting. We'll discuss. Yeah. One thing we know for sure, there is no debating uh, that the juggernaut that is Nebraska volleyball just keeps powering along. They got a, <laughs> they got a commitment yesterday. They have the number one play. They have, you know, there are numerous services just like college football, but not as plentiful that cover volleyball recruiting. So Nebraska for 23 and 24 have the number one player in the country. They got an outside hitter from Olathe yesterday in the class of 24. Um, how you doing, John Cook? 
Yeah. That is that is a absolute juggernaut that's about success, fan base, and location, location, mm-hmm. location. Sharp betting in the morning. Uh, also, when we dive into the U.S. Open, we'll get more because now we're getting some people that are vibing with the NBC coverage uh, this weekend. But the heartbreak of a near miss and what losing does to you or... Some losses are different than others. We'll get into that as we roll along till 10 on Chart Betting the Morning. Target has launched. Back on it is Gregory running out of room, and it is gone! Into the bullpen or did it? Yes, it is gone. For a second, Brock Jones pulled up at second. But it's over the fence for a home run. And 12 is a soft liner for a base hit. That'll score two. Trevor Werner gives Texas A&M the lead with a two-run, two-out single. It's 4-2 Aggie. And Texas is the first team eliminated got routed by their rival so a promising uh, season for Texas comes to an end uh, yesterday Stanford or Auburn is going home later tonight Arkansas and Ole Miss Oklahoma is 2-0 elimination game tomorrow between uh, Notre Dame and uh, Texas A&M on the SEC Invitational Uh, Greg Sankey by the way very popular guy he is loving the College World Series atmosphere you might see him standing in line at Zesto's but the commissioner of everybody else too uh, is enjoying his time here in uh, Omaha. I don't believe Lane Kiffin will be back uh, for tonight's game. Talk about somebody that was enjoying their time in Omaha. Lane Kiffin. The other day, <laughs> as he uh, flew up earlier in the day. People were asking about his dog. He left the dog at home. Um, but he, people at Ole Miss, they have fallen in love with Lane Kiffin. I mean, at, they are all in on the Lane train and what that has done to Ole Miss foot, football and just the university. Like people, that's that. You go, hey, Mike Bianco's a really good coach. Weird hey, season. By, by the way, when we go, so did he tell everybody it's Bianco now? Uh, I have no idea. He doesn't, uh, he, he, I've heard him say Bianco because his son goes by Bianco. It, everybody, so I asked around, I asked Kevin, I said, hey, what pronunciation are we doing for coach? And even during the broadcast, even though KP with us on the radio said Bianco, on the broadcast said Anko. So I'm wondering if he said or somebody said, hey, you know, we've been doing it wrong for 20 years. It's really Bianco. Hey. Like a dead, dead serious. I thought um, what's your name? Doing sidelines for his man. Uh, uh, there's Chris Butt. Nope. Uh, I do not know. And when she said Bianco, I was like, oh my gosh, she said but then the guy, they, she threw it back to the guys in the booth, and they did too. So I was, I, I immediately got on my Kevin Cooper hop, and I was thinking, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask tonight. Ah, yeah. home run! Home run! But Texas A&M hates Texas. That's that's my takeaway from yesterday. Like there is no love lost between those two athletic programs, and Texas A&M can't wait to play Texas in football in 2025. And also... Uh, they love Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M. Like the it, baseball is here, but all those people when you when you talk to them and you tell them where you're from, they want to talk football. It's a great sport. It's a great sport that's ten uh, less than ten weeks away. That's it. Football. Less than seventy days. Yes, we are. Uh, was it sixty-eight days today? Oh, sixty-eight wow. days to oh, Dublin. You're not counting down the days. You're not, no. You don't have a calendar at home that when uh-uh. you leave the house in the morning you pull off no. a date. No, I don't. I don't. I just wait till camp date opens, and then we talk about it, and then they'll play a game, and I'll do that. Uh, the so it, you so another sign that the season is closing in. Uh, Sam has started his countdown of the 50 most important players from Nebraska. He's gone with his honorable mention, which is always uh, always creates a little discussion. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I tell you what, I think there's going to be a lot of surprises of folks that. I think we assume we're going to be contributing, and I'm just not so sure. It's going to be a very interesting next six weeks. Before camp begins. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
folks are a little concerned about the art Sam's article. We we can talk to Jimmy about that too with the thumb. Yeah, and the pitch game. Or I think both quarterbacks, two of the top three, will be on a little bit of restrictions. I I wouldn't necessarily panic. But I said you know four or five months ago, Casey Thompson is the type of guy that you have to tell tell T E L L to scale it back. He's a get there early, stay late, do a lot of extra, weighted vest, walk, run, push. He's that guy. So you probably, it's probably okay to say Simadon, just a smidge. If you are an injured quarterback, somehow there is a moment. <laughs> yeah, well, wow. you, you end up at Nebraska. Martinez was injured before he got here. Casey Thompson is now, uh, was injured mm. and made it through spring, but uh, has a, a bad thumb. All right, uh, a little bit later, we'll talk um, U.S. Open. Josh Burhau will join us. We're one more major to go, and that will be at the Open. Golf won this weekend. We didn't have to talk about Phil or the live golfers who were, or there was no Tiger. But we got a great finish yesterday. Uh, by the way, what happened to the weather in Boston? We're sweltering here, and you flip on the coverage, and they're wearing, like, cool spring clothes. Well, did they not get the memo? Hey, but you know what? We're going to cool down here, too, right away. Like, pretty quick, right? I guess if you go 80s, cool. 15 degrees out would probably feel like a lot. I haven't, uh, I haven't gone with the air conditioning yet. It was a little warm when I got home last night. That's just weird. That was okay. It was like 80, it was probably 81 in the house. It was fine. 81 in the house? Yeah, I had the, the ceiling fan going. It was good. It oh, well. Shit. Here is uh, Cody to kick off uh, this hour of Sharp Betting in the Morning. Good morning, Cody. Good morning. Hey, uh, first, just wanted to say prayers up to Omaha Duchenne and Gretna community after another tragic accident. But uh, moving on past that, how about the weekend Jalen Lloyd had? Yeah, he's pretty good. National champion and then went third in the triple jump. Yeah, only, only high schooler to go 25 plus and 50 plus. Yeah, that was a heck of a weekend. And then, uh, how about some of the defense gets, you know, the World Series? I mean, that very first pitch last night with Oklahoma, guy going over the railing into Notre Dame uh, dugout, and then I think it was Oklahoma Friday, same thing where he went into the stadium. <laughs> yeah. 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 What else is going on, Cody? Oh. Hey, so did you... I'm, I'm curious. Um, how, do you, how do you celebrate Father's Day? Are you waiting till next year? Oh, no. Uh, I got a one of those dad hats that yeah. Bustin' with the Boys has yeah. from the wife, and she took the dogs out all day, and then uh, we got tickets to the call All right. So, all right. Hey, what, what's the year you have um, You have him forecasted to be in Junior Nationals? Uh, probably by 2035, right. 2036. <laughs> best, best wishes, my <laughs> man. Congrats again. Sports Dan? 2035, 2036. Seems like a little ways away. Yeah, your life's going to change. You're going to spend a lot of time going to sporting events. That's what he does now. He just take his kiddo with him. But now you're going to be going all over the country. Uh, So, Jalen Lloyd did have an incredible weekend. So, he was running at the Nike Nationals in Eugene. What are we... What's the next Summer Olympics? 2026? That yeah. sound right? Yeah. I don't know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, no. Uh, 2024 is the next Summer Olympics because we just had the Winter Olympics. Uh, so 2024, 2028. Uh, by 2028, Jalen Lloyd will be in contention to be on the U.S. Olympic team. That is my bold prediction of the morning. Yeah. And you know what else? He should... It's a little late, and he's a good student, so it would totally be for physical development he's a year younger than everybody else for his grade a almost a full that's, year that's kind of scary almost a full year yeah yeah he's physically he's got a i mean he's competing with folks that are significantly older bigger stronger he's just really really talented. he's an incredible athlete we get to see him on the football field even even more on a bigger stage coming up this year when he's playing for you. Yes, indeed. Uh, there, 
But he, like his recruitment, he's starting to get some offers for yeah. football. And because, he's, he's, because he's, I mean, he's doing all kinds of things this summer. So he's getting the, he's getting the offers, like the FCS offers, interest from FBS yeah. schools. So that will that will continue to ramp up as he gets more eyeballs on him. But and, and, and his 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 world is track and field. I know it's become very popular to say, like, hey. You know, where you guys been? You've been sleeping, this, that, and the other. There's a lot of people that are aware of his athleticism and his prowess. It is not those people's fault that cover the sport or his fault that the the football career at his previous school did not produce the statistical numbers to garner eyeballs. So it's not... It's not like folks didn't know he was talented. They just didn't have anything to talk about. Him. So the whole, the whole like, and it's like these Johnny Come Latelys too, which really aggravate me. Like, yeah, but that's more just a personal thing. But this, it's nobody's fault. It was the circumstances in which he was competing in. He just, they weren't winning a ton of games, and he wasn't getting. A ton of touches so there wasn't really I mean we're going through that now with a couple of other guys where in in track and in seven on seven they look fantastic and it's, and it's like well where you been and I'm like they haven't been playing you know what I mean now believe me the first thing I asked him hey how you feel about special teams how you feel about playing defense <laughs> for Lloyd because you know he did he has a I just want to showcase them as as many ways, especially doing the return game for kickoffs and punt returns. You know, I, I just want you just want to showcase them in as as many ways possible. But he is a uh, he's in rare rare air when it comes to local athletes here in the state of Nebraska. And he has some good insight here too. Yeah, I would uh, I would steer him towards track. He's got. 20, 28 Olympics. Hey, so so can I can I say this? I, I think, and I was kind of saying this to you off air. I think folks that are re- recruiting, and I'm going through this in my own household, so maybe it's fresh. I think folks that are recruiting these guys and doing whatever for college should talk to the kids to see what they want to do. Like, don't don't assume you know what their path is. Until they actually tell you what they want to do, right? Because I, I think we do it. I think we do them a disservice. I, I really do. I, I would say cover folks just like you normally would, regardless of what you think they're going to do in the future. I, I saw it happen with. I mean, I've seen it for like the last 15, 16 years. When we assume we think a, a guy's gonna or a gal is going to do something, we kind of. We slot that in our mind. I, I wouldn't do that to these guys. I'm just looking at his triple jump numbers. Yeah, you want me to grab the phone? Uh, yes, no, Nate. Break, it's so, uh, we'll give Lance some time here. That, that, that's, that's an unbelievable weekend in Eugene for numbers. Yeah. Now, in terms of like what he did compared to like nat- like the state records in Nebraska, and I know it's outside of the season. Remember, the, 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 only, that's yeah. the only high school to go 25 and 50 plus. 28 Olympics will be in the running. That's my bold prediction of the morning. I'm going to stick with it. So put it up on the prediction board, and we'll check back in about six years. And I think I'll be very happy. All right, 21 past the hour. Sure, I'm betting the morning at 16, 20 the Uh, we're just going to clear weather so we can see more of Greenland as we fly through. I'm still not sure if we want to just stick with clear weather for the um, for all future flights or if we do want the live weather. I kind of like the idea of the live weather, weather, but then when you get super cloudy days where you can't hardly see anything, it's just not as good. So We'll keep thinking about that. But we continue on with the Sharp and Betting Show for Monday, June 20th. Right, sharp betting in the morning, uh, 7.28 on the uh, Monday at Baseball Today on the Zone. Uh, we'll go downtown when we're done at 10, a little pregame show, 
and then uh, Stanford and Auburn an elimination game, and then some more shows. See how long they are. We've uh, had a show that was 18 minutes this weekend, I guess. Yeah, I've had a yeah, I had a couple of those. I, I remember those days. And you're just kind of sitting on standby. The hardest part is, is if you're in the. I used to always like going in the and the press box to watch the games. When to leave? Yeah. Do we go down now? Should we go now? Wait, something's gonna happen. I don't want to go down now. Then you try to calculate how much time it's gonna take, and it's yeah. I've been there, done that. Those those quick shows, man. You're like, what in the world? They even get started. I mean, that if there's a quick show, that's not good for us because that's a quick turnaround. Like we've had two of the, the three night games. Even what, what do you say with 18 minutes of a show? We wouldn't even know what to do. We do 20 hours a week. Well, and I think built into that, you have to give the rundown. And you got commercials. Yeah. Wow. So it's a quickie. Hey, welcome to Baseball Village. We'll be right back after this. How's the turnaround been? I know it's, uh, you said you had some quick turnarounds there. How's the uh, field Friday, guys been doing pretty good with that? Uh, Friday night was a, a quick turnaround. Like when the Texas-Notre Dame game started, people were late getting in because the first game went long and they wanted to get started pretty quick. So there were still people that were outside of the gates for the first game coming in. I understand the electric tickets are bugging people again. Like there's some technology that's a little iffy, but also people, you know, their smartphone. It's not like we haven't been doing this for a while with electronic tickets. But if you if you have an issue, gate four. Gate four, thank me later. There's very, very little time that there's a line. And you come in, you're in the left field corner, you can find your way here. Right, there have alleviated your issues. <laughs> here is uh, Michigan Lance. Good morning, Lance. Hey, good morning, fellas. How are you doing today? Good. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's up? Hey, hey. You always kind of call about something else, and then you bring up other good stuff. Guys are, guys what, are what, 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 we, what, what other good stuff did we bring up? <laughs> the uh, Daily Lloyd. Uh, deal situation or whatever. I don't know what you want to call it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you, man, that's, you've that's seen, that start, seen that start. You've yeah. seen that start to finish, right? Even going back to King. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you know, yeah, he's one of those kids that. When I was at Central and, and, and things, and you know, it's just it's just tough. And you know, people talk about like I love what you said about the sleeping on thing, where it's like, hey, man, they. He didn't even have a sophomore. He didn't play varsity sports until what junior year. I mean, not varsity football, I guess. You know what I mean? That's what people are saying. Sleeping on. And that was last. You know what I mean? That was just last season. I mean, they didn't have a season the year before that because of COVID. And and that's a big deal. That that hurt a lot of you know those, those you know Omaha public school kids. Uh, and and that's what made a lot of kids like, oh my man, like, what if this situation happens again? Look look what. You know, this is the aftermath that, and he's not the only one. There's others that there was seniors at the time that didn't get anything, and not just in football. I, you know, we, our, our buddy uh, Charles Wilson Jr., David, his daughter, was uh, going into her senior year for volleyball at Central. They didn't have a season like that. It was supposed to be her year, and guess what? She's not playing volleyball. She's okay with that, but who knows what would have happened if she had that big year that she was waiting on, that she worked for, and it didn't happen. And so. I think people forget that sleeping. I wasn't sleeping, man. It's, like you said, he did mean that. Did he have a lot of options? Did he miss the year? Like, so I mean, people people write on time for, you know, or and, and if he didn't, if he didn't, if he didn't care about football, if it was only about track, he could easily just stay at Central. I mean, he 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 wants to play football too. Oh yeah, yeah, and that was even like just that was even since like King Little. Yeah, ever since then, he always you know, football was the deal. When he can you know, hoop too. Start, what's that? He can hoop too. Yeah, he, he's a great athletic kid, and, and you know you just like you said, don't think for anybody. And here, here's what got me when I when I saw those offers coming in for him and Jay. Like all of a sudden, those offers come in May, and look what they came after May first. So you don't think the school that they're at, that they transfer to, like that doesn't play a part in coach, coaches, college coaches trusting, oh, they're going to go here? Oh, this, oh, so they're serious. Oh, definitely. Okay, let me pay more attention to them now. Oh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to give them an offer. That matters. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're at a program that hasn't been relevant for a while. Right. So, uh, obviously, they're, you know, he cares about football or, or, or things of that nature. And that's what... And, and, and that's the biggest thing, man. Like, 
you know, when people, it's funny because you talk about me playing catch with my son and, and, and posting, and you know, it's hard for me it, it, to talk about that and and for him to be on Twitter because it's, it's kind of going into our personal life, you know, that stuff with me. Yeah, I've oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. More, yeah. I've been giving more this past year within my work when I was working at the Street School. I gave those kids more of my personal life than ever. Um, and, and so, you know, my son has Twitter at, at Langston D18. Like, for me to even say that, he said that twice last week. I'm like, should I give him his Twitter? Should I not? Like, I don't know what to do. And, and, but I know where he wants to be and where he wants to go. And so I want to give him every opportunity, the best opportunity, the best chance that he can have. And for me to go out there and throw footballs with him, I, I wasn't a receiver coach like that. I could coach receivers, but. My thing is, hey, I'm just going to say, my job every day, you're going to catch at least 50 footballs every day. That's, if that's what you want to do, this is the work we got to put in, and that's why I do it. And, and you know, and I try to get him with quarterbacks. There's just more opportunities. That's why we're down here for, for him to have more opportunities and accessibility. So it won't be, I'm trying to prevent the Jalen Lloyd type situation. I mean, uh, our guy at Vanderbilt, Dan Jackson, you talked about it. Hey, man, places in Florida, Texas, Georgia, hey, they have more opportunities to develop their skills. And I know that's what my son needs because he's not a natural athletic, you know, guy. But his work ethic is really good, and as he does that more, he gets better. So I have to give him the most opportunities and the best opportunities I can. And that's the hindrance sometimes for a kid like the Jalen Boy and some of those other guys. It happens more often than not. You're not gonna always get the uh, the Chucky Heffers or the you know or, or the Dana Bennings or the Monsters like that. That's few and far between. Most of the guys that come from the areas of Nebraska, oh my, we gotta work at it to get there. And it's just limited opportunities. And you know, I've always been as a great ball. Even to us, though, guess what? If a, if a kid like Dylan Boyd didn't have a ball season, he would have had a spring season. The more coaches was looked at him with ball. You know what I mean? It's all about opportunity, man. Yeah, and the other the other thing is, uh, I think that's important, is when we start, and I'm not getting on, Sharpie, I'm saying generally speaking, when we say what we want a kid to do, sometimes I think we forget, like like the Isaiah McMorris's, the, um, uh, you know, the Jalen Lloyds. Jacob Arope is going to play football, right? Like, what if Jacob thinks to himself, Man, you know what? There, are, there are a lot of six four guys out there playing basketball. I don't know how far I could go. There aren't a lot of guys that look like me and football. But people say, "Oh man, Jacob, you're a great basketball player." He and he's coming off a monster basketball weekend. But I think yeah. we do the kids a disservice when we close the doors on what I saw it happen with 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 Jackson last year at Burke. Like we kind of boxed him into what we thought he was better at. So we didn't cover his other we didn't we didn't cover his other sport right. Like I th- I felt like we shortchanged him covering his sport because it was a foregone conclusion what we thought he was going to do. You know what I mean? That that's just yeah, he, that's a personal thing. And DB, what did I ask you about your son before I left? You know, in the spring, uh, I don't know if you remember. I asked about the summer. How do you balance? Hey, how are you going to balance basketball and football? Because I know she's not done with basketball, and then and people probably assume that. Oh, he's got these football offers. That's the best guy. He's been a dual sport, multi sport athlete since he was a kid, and I know he loves basketball. And, and what was your response, Damon? And you can do it. It's up to him. Right, right. But you also oh, I did. I said I will take it as far as we can until he has to make a decision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So why everybody sitting here raising the football flag? Like, I, I know you. Like, let's like, see like, And I got to battle that with my son. My son is like, Dad, I want to be with you. I want to be with you. I, I understand that. But we're going to do other things. Like, he was like basketball. I mean, you know how long he is. He's five kids going into the eighth grade, right? So, and he has these long arms. And I'm like, dude, we're not, you're not about to just stop that. You know, we're not going to be this one track, one track mind and one trick pony of, like, you have to be able to be a multi sport player because all the great ones were multi sport athletes. And so we're going to, so we're going to, so I, I got to that in his head, like, and he loves track and all that, but basketball, he's just like, I think, he has, you know, basketball is a lot of work, and I don't know if you want to put is. all the work into football and all the work into basketball. That's okay. I, I, and I, I look, I look at a guy like Deshaun Prince, you guys, and I appreciate the call, Lance, coming off another good basketball weekend. 
right? But he has the football offers. So people, oh, football, football, football. And I and I almost feel like sometimes we speak it into the kids' lives, right? And then they end up shortchanging themselves. I think you should give yourself as many options as you can to make yourself as marketable as you can. So I'm like, you know, Sean Sean, like he could, his basketball game is really starting to come around now. Like what if they, now Davon Hall may be a, a bad example because he's not going to run track, but like what if all of a sudden they just smash the four by one record next year or something like that and like, oh golly, track. But we've, we've kind of boxed him in. And I mean, if, until a guy says or gal says like they have a preference or this is what they want to do, I just think we should we should speak freely about the accomplishments versus, man, do this. I know we're, we could give opinions, right, because that's what we do. I think he should do this or I think he should. Like I'd say, oh, God, I think Malachi Coleman should be a defensive guy. Malachi Coleman's probably looking at me like, man, you're crazy. I want to play offense or mm-hmm. McIntyre, whomever else. So I know we give opinions, but... A lot of times, we don't even really ask. Because I, I bet you if you'd have asked Kay Johnson, Keegan, Xavier Watts, like what they wanted to do going into like the 10th or 11th grade, they just said basketball. And they continue to play basketball. They just figured out at, 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 at a certain point, okay, this is where the opportunities lie. I mean, but Jalen Lloyd's on a different level when it comes to track. I, I'm using the word Olympian. Now, He'll, he'll be able to go a place, and he could do two sports if they will allow him to do that. If if he wants to do track and field, like, I mean, that's a lot. It's hard on his body, it, his diet. Like, he's he's gifted, and he works super hard at it, but that doesn't mean it's easy for him. No, but again, what did you just say? He's at West Side because of track. No. He's at what he could have stayed at Central. His dad coaches at Central. He could have stayed there and ran track. He's at Westside because he wants to play football. But he's gonna get he's gonna get more exposure. I mean, going back and when Lance was the head coach, they didn't win a football game. And he's well, at, that's, he's that's got, neither here nor there. That's not at, even but he, relevant. But yeah, it's because he's at and a he place didn't now. he didn't coach him there in varsity, so it's he's not at, even an issue. He's at a place now that has been successful, and people pay attention to you at Westside. If he didn't want to play football, he wouldn't transfer. But didn't you say he's got a great relationship with the track and field coach at Westside? Yeah, what I said was his dad trusts the sprint coaches at Westside, so he felt like he was in good hands if he was going to make a football move. He's got a bright future. I mean, he, he, he can go somewhere and play both sports, but in track and field, I mean, what he did this weekend is unbelievable. It, it probably should get more attention on what he did. I mean, he, he's, got a, he's got an arc of possibly competing to be on the U.S. Olympic team if he continues on this path that is just going, I mean, he is blowing up. If that's what he wants to do. I, I hope he does. I hope he does. It'd be a great accomplishment for him. I mean, I love watching him. I mean, watching him this year for the first time in track and then at the state track and field meet, I mean, there's something special there. And he's going to get an opportunity for the next couple of years. And I, and I hope he gets the opportunity if that's what he wants to do, Damon. That somebody says you can do both at our school. Yeah, we'll I, let you play football. And I, in the but I think, but I think you, you, you need to understand Jalen's football accomplishment aren't on Lance's watch. That's on Coach Lance's no, watch. No, but it's that, at a that, program. That, that's ir- that's it's irrelevant. It's a program that hasn't been relevant. That people aren't paying attention. Well, stay on in the moment. Basis. It doesn't have anything to do with Jalen. Well, it's, you don't you don't you don't you don't use their success in the '80s as a as a positive barometer of the '90s. You, you stay current. So don't go back four or five years or something that doesn't. I mean, Jalen wasn't even at Central, but he was at a program that hasn't been hasn't had a lot of eyeballs. On well, then you now speak to place. then speak now to the school. Place. Speak to the be? school. That's put the onus put the onus on the school. That's what I said. Central hasn't been relevant. Now he's going to a school that has had great success and has produced really good football players. That has good, really good coaching. That people come and you know this. Look at guys at West Side. Guys at other programs that are successful here in the Metro that have a history of. Coaches that are really good coaches that produce players, I don't care what level they're on, coaches are going to gravitate towards them. They're going to say, who else is at Westside? Who is, who's that? Or, who's or, that or, or, or Bellevue West yeah. or North Places or Prep. they have a track record. North side, yeah. And that's that's an advantage of a place like Westside and all these other places that have had success lately so that a kid doesn't get lost. I mean, we were just talking last week. There's there's a couple of really good football players at Omaha Bryant. Yeah. How many people have seen Omaha Bryant play? Yeah. I mean, they, 
I, we had him last year on TV. I love the running back, but nobody knows about him. But if he was playing at West Side or somewhere else, then you would get a write-up on 24/7 or online on 3.com. Hey, this guy, and you'd get this. You'd have the same reaction, Damon. You would say, "Where were you?" I'm hey, Brian. He was really, really good. He's now on a different level where people are paying attention to him, and at programs where coaches are stopping in that hallway first. They're stopping at West Side to go, "Hey, coach, who do you got? You got anybody else? You got anybody upcoming?" Because they're going there first. 7:43. Uh, sharp betting in the morning. Don't forget baseball uh, today. Another doubleheader. It is chock full of doubleheaders. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, possibly Thursday. Doubleheaders. The uh, consolidated schedule. Every day is a double header. Pack your sunscreen. Pack your hydration kit. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, Ole Miss and Arkansas fans, I understand, are revved up today. I guess there was some late night debauchery going on for Arkansas fans. Those jello shots carried over, I'm sure. Fifty cents to make a jello shot. I think that's the the is that the it's probably fifty cents? Yeah, yeah maybe well, less. What's a box of jello? Dollar sixty nine? And how many boxes or how many drinks can you get out of jello? And what are they probably using? Bartons. Some bad vodka. I'm sure it's probably I bet you it's not even 50 cents. Well, it depends upon if it's a double jello shot, you know, like a double size. Well, what do you know? You don't, you don't want anything in there. But you're in charging there. 450 so you're No, the naked. markup is, is yeah, unbelievable. You're doing well. I'm sure they're probably just jello shots. Shot sizes, I mean, just based upon you're going with that many uh, that many cups, you know. <laughs> Jane, we, we need to treat you to this. I don't, know which, I don't know what one of the eight teams you would select. This after our discussion about a month ago is right up your alley. Can I get some different ones? Can I get like the a non-alcoholic? Can I get like a cherry one? Or like, like a grape one? Only you. Jordan betting in the morning at sixteen twenty this hour. He'll get a loose new hook. Nice little feed for Cogliano, has some space there with Manson, two on one developing, now a three on one, Manson holding, shooting, he scores! Man, oh, Manson! It's two, nothing, Avalanche! All right, 752 on a Monday morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome to town if you're in town for the College World Series. 68 days from the start of the college football season. Plenty of time to debate why Ohio State and Iowa have only played one time since 2013. And in that one time, Iowa beat Ohio State. I was reading uh, one of the preview magazines that uh, that was a nugget that Ohio State and Iowa play this year, but Ohio State hasn't beaten Iowa in a long time. Okay, let's have a little context. Still odd that they've only played one time. It is what it is when they, they, they put that stuff in the schedule and they shake it up and they're like, oh, this looks good, let's go with it. Balance? Who needs balance? Just play who we tell you. And then, better yet, not play who we, who we tell you. Uh, we should, uh, we, we may get a little information here before the end of the month on what the future of scheduling does look like in the Big Ten. Uh, as we all expect, no divisions. Heck, if you listen to the comments of the commissioner who, I, I think the Pac-12 hit a home run with their new commissioner, who, you know, doesn't come from a sports background, but more of an entertainment background, uh, Klybakov. What, what he's doing for the Pac-12 and the challenges that they have, uh, basically picking up the pieces for Larry, from Larry Scott. Now the Pac-12, if they can get USC football turned around and there's no reason to believe with Lincoln Riley that they will not, that conference could be in a really good spot. But he, over the weekend, and, and he has been, probably because he's not from the old school, he kind of speaks, he looks at things differently and is not afraid to express his opinion for the health of the game, but more importantly, the Pac-12. He is one of those commissioners that has come out and strongly suggested that the NCAA uh, shouldn't govern college football. But he has gone a step further, which I, I think this is probably 
the one that in, entices more college football programs is he said the 10 FBS conferences should govern college football. That they are they can be more aligned instead of separating Power Five from Group of Five. He says, why don't we get all 10 together and well, work on governing college football, which that, is a little bit different. That would actually be, I think, a lot more palpable for the masses if you didn't try to make it exclusive with just five. Yeah, I think it's an easy way to sell, to get everybody together on the same page, to come up with, okay, we think we should all do this. And, pl- and you got to think, you got to be able to schedule. So... You really do you ten, think ten is ten is better than five? Do you think we will ever get to a point where we will have universal conference schedule? Either we all agree on eight or we all agree on nine. Well, that's been my wish for what the last well since we've been mm-hmm. well or most of we've been doing this together, right? Which is what I think you have to do before you talk expansion. That's my darn near number one. That and figuring out auto qualifiers, but I'll be more open-minded to autos versus not if I once I know that there's some uniformity in the schedule I just think people were talking out of people just talking all willy-nilly about wanting expansion and then are telling me that you can't well you're never gonna have conference uniformity I'm like then you're never gonna have you're never gonna have the desired outcome of what you want with expansion and playoffs unless you simply just want to be entertained you're not gonna be not one iota closer to finding a real champion if you just want more games, then just say that. Because the manner in which you're going about it without the balance of or some uniformity, it's only going to lead to chaos. <laughs> it, it's it's only going to lead to chaos. If you get eight teams in or 12 and eight of them or six of them can still come from the SEC, that's not what you want. So understand protocol and how you want to get there. I understand balance and maybe more of those kids will go to Cincinnati and other schools and not Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, Ohio State, yada, 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 as it's been going. Uh, number one, it's going to take about seven to eight to ten years to, to matriculate. But the other thing is, without uniformity, you're not going to get to that desired outcome. They'll just be incrementally better, but still be those schools. TV's going to have a say. I mean, TV wants good games. TV doesn't want Nebraska and North Dakota. They don't want Nebraska and Georgia Southern. If they're going to pay top flight for conference rights, they're going to want conference-on-conference games or Power 5 playing Power 5. And thus, if you are paying a lot of money, you want more conference games. So we're saying 9 is the ideal number. Please stay at 9. But you can't move forward with the sport. We're in agreement here unless everybody is together. But I don't... I don't know what the tipping point is. Maybe it is TV that says, hey, if we're going to spend all this money, we want to have a say. We want, even if it's Rutgers, Maryland, we'll take Rutgers, Maryland over Rutgers and Howard or Rutgers and, uh, you know, a group of five school. Hey, hey. So give us nine uh, conference games. Well, it depends, but, right? If, again, if I'm going to have to split my pie, do I want do I want my family to be the ones to eat or do I want to give to some folks that are at the door? See, that's the, the the point of I'm going to bat for the SEC or the Big Ten. Oh, and then for the sake of college football, which, you know, your commissioner, you should be going to bat for your league, but can you work together? I, I think getting every FBS conference together is a good step. And then Everybody. <laughs> and then, I mean, this is just a sport that it's, it's never been fair, and we don't agree on much. And we all kind of operate on our own. But yet the sport somehow produces a champion. But college football... It just, and you feel like, we feel like, college football's gotten it right. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And, and again, I, I, I hear it. It's for the most part, so it's college basketball. Right? We don't really... Yeah. Although, I don't know if North Carolina was the second best team in the country. Right? Or something like yeah. Generally speaking, the champ is... Maybe this year isn't a great example to say that. Well, maybe, maybe you got to go back to like 2012, 2013. Up until then, I think they had been getting it right. I'm not so sure this was the best team in the country last year. You talking KU? Yeah. And this is coming from a guy that liked them all year, remember? Oh, sleeping on a kid, just hard to scout. Blah, 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 blah. But 
for the most part, basketball had gotten it right. I'd say ten out of the last two out of the ten out of the last yeah. twelve years, right? Nine out of the last twelve. The, there's the part of the the football world that you have to be careful because I don't think you want to. You, you, you're not looking to pull away from March Madness. We'll take football. We can govern football on our own, but we still want to be involved in March Madness. But I, 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 I think the idea and a commissioner saying this out loud to go to ten, to have ten FBS conferences together to try and figure this out is a good step. But it still feels like we're early in the summer. That there's something major going to happen. That if you're starting to break away. It's going to come before this upcoming season. Right, Eight o'clock, two hours of the books, two to go. More about Matt Fitzpatrick's day yesterday at Brookline. The excitement of majors golf and winning a major. Mm. Uh, and and majors golf remains unmatched. What a day yesterday! What a finish yesterday! The back nine. There was the heartbreak, and then there's the emotion of Matt Fitzpatrick winning, celebrated with his family, celebrated a place he won a U.S. Amateur. His caddy, longtime caddy, finally gets a major, kisses the flag. We'll get into that with Josh Burhal coming up in the next hour. So as you graduate. Halftime, sharp bidding in the morning. 1620 The Zone, 1620thezone.com, brought to you by Hard Cigars, Pipes, and Lounge. We'll enjoy a nice cigar, a little cocktail, a little pipe. You know, sit around, shoot the breeze. Hard Cigars, Pipes, and Lounge is the place to be. Relaxed environment, pretty cool setup. Great location off the North 48th Street exit uh, off of Mormon Bridge Road, located right next to Cubbies. All right, NBA draft is later this week, coming up on Thursday. Somehow, Jabari Smith could be the number one pick overall by the Orlando Magic. Uh, will Bryce McGowan's find a way into the back end of the first round? The uh, highest draft pick out of Nebraska still remains Teron Lou. 98, he went 23rd overall. Uh, I do not see Bryce McGowan's being drafted before 23, but is he selected towards the tail end of the first round, or does he fall to somewhere early second, mid-second round? Just looking for guaranteed money. Come on, first round. Come on, first round. Uh, we do know that he'll be selected, um, but if you go by a lot of mock drafts, they've kind of, he's been on a little bit of a yo-yo uh, over the last four to five weeks. Some will have him 28, 29, and then some will drop him a little bit further in that second round. I mean, if, if he does go late in the first round, there could be a great opportunity there to be picked up by the world champions. You know who seems to be on the, on the move, on the uptick is... Malachi Brandon. Yes. Like, I asked about him a couple of weeks ago. All the reports were he's on the rise. We know he's invited to the green room now. Like, and I, isn't he, he's one of those guys that intrigued me for Ohio State because you almost felt like these guys got a pretty decent roster. Liddell was yep. starting to play really, really well and become a, a three-level guy. And, um, But Mal and Malachi Brandon was so so smooth, like he was tough and made big shots, and he was just a youngin. He's got decent size. Like he's a guy that's got me interested. If we're just if we're thinking like Big Ten, like Malachi Brandon is one of those guys I'm going to be looking at in a couple of years and think, wait, where did he play school? Where did he go to basketball? Yeah. Where did he play again? Because you know they it was quick. Yes, yes. He one year at Ohio State, and, he and kind of and unless you're in Columbus or followed him close. Yeah. Or saw him the night he played Lincoln. And because he wasn't, his name wasn't Johnny Davis, Keegan Murray. Yep. Shoot, even McGowan's was overshadowed. Mm -hmm. He ain't win enough, right? Yeah. Branham was good against Nebraska. Now, he was a... He was way good. Yeah, he shot 41% behind the arc. He he strikes me as a guy, because of this kind of a late run where his name is getting mentioned, he'll still be drafted outside of the lottery. But I don't think, just based off what you said, and I feel this way, would anybody be surprised if he's an all-star? soon after he has yeah. entered the NBA. Got game, man. And he's he's kind of saucy, too. Like, I like his competitiveness. So it should be a fairly good on Thursday night for the Big Ten. Keegan Murray is going to go in the top five. I, I, don't, I don't see, you know, Keegan Murray falling past Sacramento or even Detroit. 
And Jaden Ivey is probably a guy that's four, five, six, seven. Yeah, he seven. wasn't Ivey either. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny um, Davis, Murray, or Ivey. But if you have, I mean, the, the Big Ten's going to be an opportunity to get two guys drafted in the top five, top six. And then Johnny Davis, top ten, I'm probably 10, 11, 12, somewhere in that range. I've seen a lot of mocks with that. So there's three guys you could have drafted out of the Big Ten that are in the top 12. Yeah. You mentioned Branham. Branham maybe falls to 14, 15, just outside of the lottery but with a huge upside. Um, and then E.J. Liddell, his teammate, he's going to be drafted probably top you know, 15 to 20, I would imagine, in that range. Yeah, he strikes bef- me as that kind of guy. before the season started last year, you just said E.J. Liddell is a top 20 NBA draft pick. I mean, he added such range to his offensive game. He's, you know, he's top four or five in the league in shot blocks. He could guard multiple positions. His body... How about the transformation from his time in Columbus with his body type? Go get it, E.J. Liddell. Anything. Yeah. Be a good night for the uh, Big Ten. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and it will be It'll be one of those things, we do this with football more than we do basketball, is Ohio State going to have two guys drafted probably in the top 20. And they're going to go, hmm, so what weekend were they playing on? Oh, I get it. I get it. Remember a couple years ago when they got off to like the 10 and 0 start? Like, oh my gosh. And then the wheels inevitably came off. Oh my gosh. I think the verdict is kind of still out. Right? I mean, a lot of ups and downs. So I'm looking on Yahoo. Their latest mock draft has McGowan's 29th to the Grizzlies. And there are 30 picks in the first round. Mm-hmm. So Golden State is at 28. And then Memphis and Denver has the last pick in the first round at 30. They actually have another Big Ten player projected, Caleb Houston. Oh, wow. From Michigan. Really? So in Yahoo's mock draft, the the guys that we just mentioned, throw in McGowan's. Caleb Houston's moving like that, huh? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's one of those, doesn't that just strike you as one of those upside guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, McGowan's is kind of the same way. Guy that is very young. Uh, that's going to need to add to his body, but you project him to be an NBA guy, and you you know put him in the lab. Um, McGowan's playing with Moran. Hey, when you watch, yeah. and maybe he just draws my ire because he was such an antagonist. Uh, does Shohan strike you as the guy as a top ten guy, Baylor? No. Easy. And and granted, they played in a wild game, and he was way out of control and maybe that's what's in my head but watching enough Baylor like okay he's gonna go top 10 top 10 go ahead I'm not mad at you anymore do you think if you're Oklahoma City and I I don't know it just feels like Jabari Smith is going to Orlando if you're Oklahoma City and you select Chet Holmgren how you feel um I, do you think you've drafted a superstar or a... I think that, I think they think project. they're getting a star. You know? He gets better every year. And he's young. Uh, he'd be hard for me to pass on. Uh, David writes in, he goes, maybe I misheard your stat. It wasn't Eric Piekowski drafted higher than Luke. Yes, he was, but the highest draft pick since then. So Piekowski was 15th mm. overall. But you're going back... Lou was 23rd, and that's 98. Uh, that's 24 years. As that's now, the time. Now, we could we could be in a nice little spot here in this area where if McGowan's is a first-round guy, uh, could have a potential first-round guy next year from Creighton. I mean, Creighton, next year in the NBA draft could be a good, another great recruiting tool for Creighton. If you're a Kaluma? And, and you know what? You could do a couple. You're, you're in a run here with Creighton where draft night could be really, really good to you. Yeah. Guys that are going and all the attention that you would get. And and worst case scenario, he's gonna have some he's gonna have some poster poster children's for folks making money because AOC's coming off multiple good mm-hmm. camps and so is um, the best player that they had last year. Uh, wait. No question. 
why did I just draw a blank? Because I was getting ready to say something about Nimhart after the was in the draft. Ryan Hawk. Hawkins. So, I mean, yeah, you'll, they'll be back. That staff will be able to look and say, hey, listen, we got guys that are making pretty good money playing basketball. So Kaluma, you want to be one of those guys? Yeah. So Kaluma, when when the draft is over and people throw out their 23 mock drafts, Kaluma is going to be mid first round to start. Yeah. And then maybe depending on yeah. the upcoming season with what is in front of you. I don't know. He, he's, he's probably a little hurt now. But I say he's going to start mid first mid round and then whatever happens this season could work. Oh, I was thinking into... mid 20s. I don't know. I didn't, did I hear first round? Okay, yeah. Yeah, mid first round. Yeah, that's 14, 15, 16. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And then depending on what ca- what yeah. happens over the course of this yeah. upcoming season, could play himself into that lottery spot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that. And he will be a guy that you will look at and go as a body type when you're 6'7", 220, upside. You have a nice framework of international competition, two years in college, and then there's the upside part of a guy that has his kind of skills. And you would think also that... A guy like Shireman, who gets what he needs to hear from the NBA and comes and plays his one year at Creighton, that with a good season, he's somebody that could find himself on the second round being drafted as well. Yeah, for him not to put up ridiculously good numbers and be efficient would be a shock. And an an offensive friendly, playing for an offensive genius, Mm -hmm. when you already have a a very uh, his skill set is advantageous to play. I mean, fudge. Well, if, 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 if you're if you're Mason Miller, some of these guys, you're like, oh man, there goes thirteen extra points. I mean, it's it's like that. It's a good problem to have. You wait your turn. Good players are waiting yeah, your turn. Yeah, if you're patient. Huh. <laughs> and, uh, that goes back to the structure of your. Your team. Yeah. Of, and your culture, you, right? You understand your role. Nothing was promised to you. We have a really good team. There are guys in front of you. Someday you're going to be that guy, and somebody's going to be waiting behind you. But and you're you going to win. And get, you're going to you win. get to, hey, hang in there with me now. Yeah, and, and for some, like in his case, he's already sat out a year. Maybe that's a kind of a different conversation. But I think that's a great that's a great problem to have. And you just keep rolling them over. It does have depth. Uh, and the thing with Shireman is you come back and you're able to show NBA scouts that physically you can withstand playing the schedule in the Big East and you can play it on defense and offense, and especially on defense. Offense, it doesn't impact. You have been you look exactly the same as you did at South Dakota State, but now you're playing with more, more of an abundance of players around you. But if you're able to do it defensively in that league and what you're going to be asked to guard, and I'm an NBA scout and that was my concern on you, I'm thinking... All right, I, I got my question <laughs> answered, and he's a you know maybe he is somebody that that falls in, you know finds a way into the uh, second round. No, I, I think Creighton is on the verge of of enjoying that Thursday after the NBA season comes to an end, and especially next year, you potentially have a lottery pick. All right, eight eighteen, we'll talk uh, golf before the hour's over. Jimmy Watkins will uh, stop by. Uh, we have we have not had an opportunity to talk basketball with him, uh, so maybe we'll get in some uh, basketball with Jimmy. And then also Aaron Fitt will stop by. Uh, we're three days into the College World Series. Winner's bracket game late tonight. Uh, Ole Miss and Arkansas. Elimination game coming up this afternoon between uh, Stanford and Auburn. And, of course, you can hear all the games all the way through the championship series, which is slated to begin on Saturday right here on The Zone. There's Damon. I'm Gary. There's Shane. Sharp betting in the morning on 1620 The Zone. Have broken it open. They lead it 6 1. Nothing new. Over 300 yards. I spat. All right, a lot of attention towards recruiting this weekend football recruiting, basketball recruiting, uh, the juggernaut that is Nebraska volleyball. Uh, it just keeps turning along. Got another Recruiting. major pickup yesterday. Uh, 
number one national recruit according to a couple of services for 24. An outside hitter, six foot two from Olathe, Skyler Pierce. We don't spend a lot of time on high school volleyball recruiting, uh, but Nebraska, we may need to start to cover. People are, I'm going to ask you about Friday Night Lights camp here in just a moment. We may need to go see this dream team camp that, that Nebraska volleyball puts on. It must be something. Uh, they, the, the talent, unbelievable, and the commitments they get out of there as they continue to just add to this beast. It is success of a program, the head coach, the players that you've produced once they've been in your program, fan base, and then location, location, location. Look, you are in a state that produces high-level volleyball players that can supplement a couple of programs in the state that play volleyball at a high level. You also are sandwiched. You're not. You're on the other side of Iowa. You're north of Kansas. You're not very far from Kansas City. You've got Colorado. I mean, you are in a... John Cook is in a great spot right now, and he just continues to recruit at an extremely high level. I and mean, look at his 23 class, which, again, is going to be one of the best. That whatever... Whatever he's doing to get to where he wants to go or however long he wants to do this, he also is putting this program in a great spot for if somebody else comes in when he decides to step down. But the one thing I, I always I'm always curious and I think is is his his recruitment. You know, people know Nebraska volleyball as John Cook. But John Cook has always recruited to the program, not recruited to me. And you hear that continually when somebody of this stature commits to the program they're committing to nebraska coach cook's name is brought up but it's, it seems to be a little bit further down on the list i mean I, it's, it's, they, they, they were juggernaut. they were low in 2020 when the recruiting class was sixth that was with with baden horse yeah. yeah. and now i mean you know what he did in the 2021 class i mean like what are we talking about it, he just keeps turning it over. And, and when you think that they're going to slow up or, or change that happens with who's out on the recruiting trail representing Nebraska, they're, 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 a, they're a juggernaut right now. And they have, for two straight years, in 23 and 24, the number one player. Good to be JK. Uh, JC. We were, we were talking. So I was you know, busy on Friday. Uh, you were out of town, but we both talked to people. Do we know exactly who shined at Friday Night Lights? Because it does sound like Hayden Moore from Colorado is close to a commitment to Nebraska, the yeah. linebacker. Uh, doesn't sound like anybody is really close, like, within the week out of that camp. Mm -hmm. I will be curious to see what happens, and he camped a while back, but I will be curious. The, the, the Mario Miller thing is now, is now fully interesting to me. Because I would... You know, two weeks ago, I would have probably locked that. Now it's interesting. Cause I'm not, cause not he's in. gone back to LSU. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we'll see what happens with Georgia and some other players. I mean, they are the defending national champs. But as far as as stars out of the weekend, I I got the sense a lot of people were impressed with the big man camp as as much as anything, which. For them, kind of closes out their camp. Yep. Kind of circuit deal. Uh, apparently, you know, Ryan Robinson, Ryan Robinson, who got an offer, was really, was really, really good uh, on Friday. So, I mean, I'm not sure. I asked about a couple of guys locally, and it's kind of strange. Don't really have a consensus. So maybe it was when you watched them or what your expectation yeah. level was. Uh, when you were watching him. But the other thing is, we talk about him all the time. Uh, how about the offer from North Dakota State for, for, Sharmar, for Marty? For him. It's a big-time offer. Mm -hmm. Those guys won a lot of games. They do. And usually when they recruit a player from here, they have success when they go north on 29. <laughs> now, he, yeah. he, 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 he... There's a, there's, there's a, there's a stick in the nurse and does right? So... So he's an interesting case because uh, he, he, he's going to be one of the heart and souls of that Creighton Prep team. And he is really, really good. I mean, it's fudge. No pressure on Coach Yonk, huh? No. I mean, we had a quarterback, by the way, that also... And they're, and they're old. Yeah. Like, they, those guys are older. They're not as old as Notre Dame baseball, but you know, where every guy looks like he's mid-30s and has a portfolio and 
two and a half kids on a white picket fence home. He's got a quarterback who apparently threw the ball, spun the ball really well down in Friday Night Lights. Yep. Um, but Brown is somebody I've, I've heard him say, I, I'd love a Nebraska. I'd love to play in Nebraska. But he, he's he's a realist, though. He I listen, I read closely, and I compared, like, just because we played with him, and I know Mac Damon, I know some guys in the family. Um, Sauter was kind of blown away. It's the first thing he said to me at AL. He's like, man, because Marty Brown is impressive. I go, yeah. Like, it's not just the physical thing. He doesn't say much, so you don't know what's in there. But when he does, like, he's not, um, he's very much a realist. Like, when you, 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 I was reading kind of through the lines and then gleaning in some information, talking to Sauter ahead of time about All right, I think we're going to leave it there. Kind of uh, super choppy on the video as we landed. I don't think you're really supposed to land here, obviously. Um, but we're going to camp on the ice once again here in Greenland. We've made it to close to the southern tip of Greenland, right by all these little uh, inlets. We are going to camp here, of course. Until next time, we'll take off from here, go up the east coast of Greenland, and then get over to Iceland, probably in the same plane so we can go a little bit faster. Iceland, once we land in Iceland, we'll probably go back to our original plane and, so we can go a little bit slower and check out Iceland. Obviously, after that, we'll head over to the UK, but that'll be all in future episodes. For now, signing out from Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 World Tour.